All right, let's begin. So uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Solutions Plus team, I am pleased to welcome you all to today's kickoff of the Kathmandu training on electric mobility. Uh, this session is run as a Zoom meeting, as you have noticed. So meaning we are able to interact more with each other. And so we will start our session off with uh, basic housekeeping. Uh, please note that the session is being recorded and the recording and the presentations will be available for you afterwards. We have also muted everyone by default so that you know the session will not be accidentally disrupted. But if you would like to talk later during the discussion, you can also unmute or request to verbalize your queries using the microphone icon. Please also send a message to the host if you encounter any challenges on that. Yeah. So to minimize disruptions, kindly switch off uh, cameras in the meantime. And however, if you have questions and, and comments, please submit them via the chat box and we will have a dedicated time for discussions. So please indicate also in your chat to whom you are addressing your uh, questions. Presentations are generally going to be in English. So if someone would like to ask the questions in Nepali, you're most welcome. And in to ease our discussions later, we could also uh, could we also ask you to rename yourselves with this naming convention. So start with your name and perhaps indicate your affiliation, whether you're coming from the ministry or an academic institution or an NGO. We also see this aiding us in understanding where the questions are going to come from in the chat box. The discussion, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, might be potentially done in both Nepali and English. Uh, my co-moderator, Bhushan, whom I will introduce shortly, will translate the key points after each session. Uh, my name is Kathleen de Matera Contreras, and I am with Clean Air Asia, and I will be your moderator for this session. Joining me as a co-moderator is Bhushan Tuladhar from Sajja Yatayat. He will also moderate the exciting panel discussion that we will have this afternoon. This training program is organized by the Solutions Plus project, and our goal is to kickstart the transition to electric mobility in various parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Solutions Plus project uh, consortium is uh, made up of about 50 partners globally. If you joined us uh, last week in the Asia regional training, you have heard activities in, in Kathmandu, in Hanoi, and in Pasig directly from our partner cities. Uh, in a minute or two, you will hear more about the Solutions Plus project and the Kathmandu activities. So this is just the first uh, of our four-day training on electric mobility in Kathmandu. Uh, our goal, uh, basically, we have two. Uh, we would like to support the development of electric uh, mobility road mapping in Nepal, supporting the transition, and strengthen the Kathmandu stakeholders' capacity on uh, towards this transition. So on EV technical features and standards, we have uh, throughout the sessions, we'll have specialized topics on uh, policies and plans, uh, operation and maintenance and retrofitting, planning for EV charging systems. Today, we'll focus on uh, contextualizing where are we at in Nepal, what is the status of e-mobility, what are the policies. We'll also hear about the integration with uh, urban mobility planning today. Tomorrow, um, you will see on the screen, we will focus on operation, maintenance, and retrofitting. On Thursday, our focus will shift to the charging infrastructure. How do we plan this in Nepal? And then on Friday, there will be a site visit to demonstrate to uh, interested participants the components of, of EVs and charging systems. So more, on, more about that uh, towards the end of our session today. We have a full afternoon uh, as we will hear uh, about the situation in, in, on the ground. Yeah? So that will be presented by Mr. Bushan and then Mr. Shiva. We'll hear about a case study from Kochi, India from Ms. Simi Sashi. And then the second block of our discussion will focus on National Urban Mobility Program for which we would welcome Dr. Oliver La from Wuppertal Institute and Assistant Secretary uh, uh, Sheila from the Department of Transportation in the Philippines. She's joining us also today. And then we proceed to the panel discussion with six distinguished guests. So again, please note that after each session, uh, Wishan will provide a short summary uh, in either Nepali or English. 
So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Shritu Shrestha. So she's a research fellow at the Research Unit Mobility and International Cooperation in Wuppertal Institute. So her expertise is in providing technical assistance to different Asian cities on climate action and implementation of low carbon urban transport. Shritu will introduce us to the Solutions Plus project and the Kathmandu activities and that will kick start our discussion today. Shritu, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Kat. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and also namaste from my side. Um, as Kathleen mentioned, I'm Shritu Shastra Bhupatal Institute, a resource institute in Germany. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce our Project Solutions Plus, uh, which provide integrated urban electric mobility solutions in the context of Paris Agreement, SDGs, and new urban agenda. Yeah. Uh, Solutions Plus is an EU-funded project under Horizon 2020. It started last year in January 2020 and will run until December 2023. Uh, it has 46 consortium partners. Uh, it includes uh, the partners uh, from Research Institute, Academia, Business Industries, uh, local government, UN organizations, and uh, transport operators. As you can see, uh, we are engaged in 10 living labs, uh, such as Kathmandu, Pasig, Hanoi, and Nanjing in Asia, Dar es Salaam and Kigali in Africa, Quito and Montevideo in Latin America and Hamburg and Madrid in Europe. Uh, Solutions Plus is also uh, a part of large EU mobility platform in which uh, we are working together with UN, UN Environment and uh, International Energy Agency uh, supported by CHEF. Um, the overall objective of Solutions Plus is to accelerate transformational change towards sustainable urban mobility through innovative and integrated electric mobility. This we carry out supporting the development of prototypes such as electric two and three wheelers, e-buses and e-quadricycles, mainly e-mobility for shared and public transportation, as well as logistic services. Uh, the project also includes uh, or focuses on operation and integration of those vehicles to achieve sustainable urban mobility solutions, where we also look into business opportunities, industry partnerships, uh, working together with local and national government. The project has uh, five uh, main conceptual approach, which includes inform um, about e-mobility solutions in a comprehensive toolbox, uh, inspire various stakeholders, um, develop partnership among industries, uh, implement the innovative demonstration projects that are scalable and replicable, and also help integrate those solutions into EV policy uh, for the transformational change. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we support a complete package of e-mobility, providing the business model and associated tools. Uh, for EVs, operating them with su suitable charging system and integrate them uh, in overall mobility planning, such as uh, mobility as services, uh, solutions, and also uh, eco-routing. Uh, to develop this, uh, we work closely with local context, uh, understanding the local context and the city's uh, needs. Um, so in Solutions Plus, uh, of course, uh, we look into the capacity building activities. So capacity building plays a key role in promoting e-mobility. And uh, we develop different forms of capacity building activities targeting various stakeholders in the form of trainings, a global e-learning program, and peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Um, as an example, uh, we have we just conducted global e-learning program with the title e-mobility more than uh, just electrifying cars. They are available online uh, in Mobility Academy webpage. Uh, this training, so today the training is also a part of our regional training program in which uh, we develop uh, focus training in different regions in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, I hope, as Kathleen mentioned, some or most of you took part in our Asia regional training on e-mobility last week. Uh, we are also developing a comprehensive toolbox uh, containing information on, on all the thematic areas of the project as well as demonstration project. Uh, we will launch this, uh, uh, launch this toolbox soon uh, by early uh, November. 
Uh, we also have started a startup incubator, uh, bringing together all the uh, startup working in our cities to support um, the startup, uh, to support them on developing business model on demand services and also uh, training, uh, developing trainings and also uh, partnership. Um, this is an overview of uh, demonstration act actions in Solutions Plus uh, cities, uh, such as uh, shared moped in Hanoi, uh, multi-purpose and smart e-quadricycle in Pasig, uh, uh, shared e-kick scooters in Hamburg, inverted pantographs uh, for e-bus charging in Madrid, uh, shared e, uh, e shared e two wheelers in Kigali, uh, e cargo bikes in Montevideo. So it includes various forms of uh, vehicles and also services. And also in Kathmandu, we are focusing on retrofitting the vehicles. Um, I will briefly go into the activities in Kathmandu in the following slides. Uh, the demonstration action in Kathmandu aims to support the ecosystem of electric mobility to enhance public transportation. Uh, for this, we have demonstration components such as retrofitting a diesel bus to e-bus, uh, redesigning e-three-wheelers with modular concept, uh, which has a multi-purpose use, um, and also a small e-shuttle van. Uh, for this, we are working with Saja Yatayat, our local partner, um, which is also, Saja Yatayat is also, uh, also promoting an e-bus in public transportation fleet in, in Kathmandu. The conversion of uh, diesel bus to e-bus is uh, first of its kind tested in Kathmandu. Uh, so local company is carrying out this with the support of Solutions Plus Consortium in which they are mainly, uh, I mean, replacing the drive system. Uh, so this project has a high scale of potential that support uh, policy planning in vehicle conversion. Uh, with the local startup in Kathmandu, we are developing E3 wheelers, which is modular and multi-purpose concept. The concept was developed during the pandemic time when, uh, when the existing E3 wheelers of Safa Tempo drivers had to remain idle due to social distancing rule. So therefore our startup are trying to remodel them with a modular concept, such as use them also uh, as a passenger service, waste collection and cargo, ser uh, cargo services. Uh, so we are developing basically two variants on this. Uh, one is on the new design and the other one is to remodel the existing Safa Temple. Um, so under Solutions Plus, beside our demonstration activities, we are also working on the impact assessment of demonstration activities mentioned earlier and also develop scale of concept. Uh, we also enhance engagement with European industry in component supply and advisory services on vehicle designs. Um, as an example, uh, we are also trying to demonstrate value powertrain in our E3 wheelers prototype. Uh, so also we are also engaged with the, with various industry, uh, various <laughs> universities also, as for example, the students from uh, uh, universities such as TU Berlin and uh, um, uh, Uni Technical University of Denmark as a, uh, to develop uh, uh, the innovative resource or ideas to promote e-mobility in Kathmandu. So with this, I end my presentation. This is our Solutions Plus uh, team. Please visit our website for more information on the project and thank you so much. Um, I'm happy uh, to, uh, to take your questions, if any. Thank you, Shitu. Um, yes, if you have any questions, again, don't forget to put them in the chat box. If whether it, that would be in Nepali or in English, that is fine. Again, we have a moderator present in the session. First, uh, we would like to get to know you better. Uh, my colleague Nash will, or Sam will present a slide, a Slido questionnaire. Uh, shortly, and we would like to invite you to give us a better picture of uh, your affiliation. So what are you representing? Um, are you from the private sector, the national government, um, the academia or research organization? Are you from the local or sub-national government? Um, or are you from the general public and or independent? So could you give us a, a some idea of uh, the make composition of this uh, uh, training session. There are a lot of you who are coming from the private sector uh, groups, I believe so. Okay. 
to still have more. All right, so um, thank you so much. Um, we will proceed now. Um, in the next discussion, we will have, uh, we'd like to welcome back again, uh, Bushan. We will talk about, uh, we'll, we'll hear about an overview of what is e-mobility now in, in Nepal, uh, what is the status, what has been the, the trend over the last decade, over the last couple of years, uh, where are we going? You know? So Bushan uh, is a board member at Sajayatayat and he's leading an initiative to introduce the e-buses um, in the Sajayatayat fleet. So as you heard earlier, one of our pilot activities is on the e-buses. So they are uh, one of our partners here in this uh, intervention. Um, they recently signed an agreement to procure 40 more e-buses and they have committed to not purchase any more diesel buses. He used to be the chief technical advisor in Southeast in South Asia for UN Habitat uh, Urban Basic Services branch. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just going to give an overview of electric mobility in Nepal, a little situational analysis of what's going on, what are the trends, and what can we expect so far, and um, and so on. So, first, Namaskar. My English ma presentation got so. Tarok last ma ali gati Nepali ma pani esko chahi summary dinner prayas kar so. Aaja ko mere yu presentation ma. Nepal ma vidutiya parivon sambandhi um, overview dine ho. Nepal ko um, vidutiya parivon ma kye bhai raya chara agari ko baatu kye huna sakcha bane ra. I'll be talking about the transport sector in Nepal, a little bit of historical context, uh, current status and trends, challenges, opportunities, and the way forward. Transport sector. Nepal's transport sector is basically dominated by road transport, about 90% of all trips. And within that road transport sector, then 90% of passenger vehicles, of which we have about 3.5 million, are passenger vehicles, near 90% of vehicles, really. And even there, 96% are private vehicles. And that is increasing day by day. So if you look at the numbers, in 1990, about 11% of the overall vehicle fleet was public transport vehicles. 2018, that has gone down to 5%. If you look at the electric vehicle fleet, it's about 1%. But 80% of that 1% is three wheelers. And we see this um, in a graphical, you know, if you put a graph of the motorcycles and uh, vehicles, it's going up very steeply. Um, you'll see that about a 14% growth annually in vehicle population. And if you just look at two wheelers, it's 17% in growth rate. Now that's very high for a country with a population growing at around 2.3% or so. Um, as a result, what we have is now um, motorcycles dominate the streets um, with about almost 80% of the vehicles registered are 80, you know, motorcycles. Um, almost 8% 8, 8 are you know, small light duty vehicles such as car, jeep, van, and then buses would be only about 1.5%. And then you add to that uh, micro buses about 0.25%, mini buses about 7.7% and so on. So that makes it 2-3% of these bus fleet. And then you've got some e-rickshaws as we talked about, which is basically electric three wheelers. All of that is consuming a lot of fuel, and um, the petroleum consumption in Nepal is skyrocketing. It's um, going up at around 21% per year in the past decade, and um, particularly diesel um, consumption is very high, and that of course is resulting in a lot of air pollution as well as um, you know disruptions in the economy in a way. Because if you look at all our all the revenue that we earn from exporting everything and you put that on one side and you put all the money we spend on importing just one item petroleum the petroleum the money spent on petroleum is twice as high as all our imports combined so this uh, you know is causing great pains uh, causing huge trade deficits in the country as well electric mobility came into the country quite a um, long time ago almost 50 years ago we had electric buses that ran from the city of Kathmandu to Bhaktapur. Um, initially, we had around 16 of them, later went up to 32, um, but they stopped operations in around 2008, mainly due to mismanagement. And then, you know, in, in, when we talk about buses, battery operated buses were launched in 2018, five of them, but they're not in operation. And then we have two um, electric buses run by Sundari Atai that, that are operating in Ring Road area and more um, on its route on the way. Um, three wheelers, like I said, it, it, you know, we've had these Safa tempos, so brilliant, wonderful little vehicles for the past, you know, 25 years. And we have about 700 of them in Kathmandu. And besides that, almost 30,000 electric rickshaws in the Tarai. 
electric cars as well. We've had them for a while. Um, the first ones were little Reva cars that came. And then now we have around 1,000 or so e-cars. I think this, this number is from last year, so it's definitely gone up. Um, electric two-wheelers as well, around 6,000 of them. Um, again, this has gone up. These are, um, the price is quite competitive now in the market. You can buy an electric two-wheeler for about the same price as an electric, or sorry, a, a petrol two-wheeler. But still, the demand is not going up very high, mainly because of consumer confidence uh, on these two-wheelers are still very low. There's been some attempts to convert IC engine vehicles to um, electric, um, starting with, in 1992, the, there was a small group um, of you know, enthusiasts in electric te vehicle technology, um, electric vehicle development group. They converted this small little Volkswagen car. Um, in 1993, as I said, Safa tempos were, the ch original chassis were from um, diesel tempos that got converted into um, Safa tempos. And this is, like I said, quite a long time ago. In fact, before even electric vehicles were starting, you know, produced in India. Ulas Motor, a local company, actually um, made electric vans in 2006. There were some attempts to convert um, electric van by Sri Eco Visionary in 2006. They did a good job. In fact, it was converted. Um, 2007, a small bus was converted by Himalayan Light Foundation. And then also a different type of, you know, tour, um, three wheeler by um, Sri Eco Visionary again in 2008. And in recent times, some other attempts have also been done. So there has been some progress. But the picture isn't all rosy. This actually is um, unfortunately a dump site for clean vehicles in located in what was the trolley bus um, depot and actually now is compound of Department of Transport Management. And ironically, it's just located across the street from the parliament. Um, the, the writing on the bus actually says, Manai Bausha or I am the future. But unfortunately, these trolley buses are just dumped there and several of the electric um, tempos are also dumped there. Um, in fact, I just took this picture yesterday. So it's unfortunate, but it also shows that there are challenges in the way. Okay, there is definitely possibilities. There's a lot that we have done, but also um, we have made some mistakes in the past that we need to learn from. Also in terms of policies, there are policies. In fact, this picture shows Nepal's prime minister launching the Nepal Action Plan for Electric Mobility three years back. The other person in the picture was the then um, environment minister. So this policy has been launched but um, implementation has been fairly weak. And then the same day, these five buses were launched, but the buses never really came into you know, operation because of various um, issues with um, um, testing of those buses. So even though some places policies are there, they need to be backed up by programs, by action, and by commitment to move this um, agenda forward. Um, this is the data from I got from customs um, in, in the past five years. Um, electric vehicle um, has been import has been dominated by three wheelers, as I said earlier. And the three wheelers numbers, you know, it went up. It was quite high five years ago. And that has also come down. After, in the past couple of years, two wheelers have gone up slightly, but not enough. And um, in 2019, 20, 2021, 20, it was quite low because the custom duty um, was um quite high at that time it was increased so this fluctuation in policy results in a fluctuation in the market um that we have seen and this year in fact with the government putting out more favorable policies that number is due to go up it's going, already going up um, but still um it, it's something that we need to be careful about um as we move along like i said the demand for electric um, vehicle is rising this year, particularly after the reduction in custom and excise duty in 2021. And in fact, supply is not keeping up with the demand. In the, the first um, article here, the title says, Bidutia Gari Kinne Body, Supply China. The demand has gone up, but the supply is lagging. And if you book now, you're not going to get the vehicle immediately. In fact, you're going to wait several months before the vehicle comes. Similarly, for charging stations, when the Nepal Electricity Authority um, invited proposals to setting up charging stations, immediately they had 150 proposals to set up these charging stations. So, which means that people are showing interest in setting up charging stations as well. Banks are giving um, special loans for electric vehicles. This um, other poster over here shows NMB Bank saying that, you know, they'll give special um, loans for 80% of the cost of the electric vehicle at 6.84% interest rate. So what this tells us is that 
there is potential. The, as soon as the custom and excise duty went down, the demand has started to go up. Um, but still, in the two-wheeler industry, two-wheeler sector really, and the electric bus sector, the demand is still low. I think right now the demand is increasing in the light duty vehicle sector. Now, if you look at globally, globally also, this is, you know, booming. Um, if you look at, these are numbers from the Bloomberg NEF um, annual report that they put, put out, electric vehicle outlook. Um, you see that particularly in the bus segment, right? It's, it's going up steeply. Um, it's very high, the share of the fleet. And that's mainly driven by policy. And then you see also, you know, you know light duty vehicles and so on. High commer heavy commercial vehicles is kind of low, but that is also due to come up very soon. And one of the reasons for this is the falling prices of battery. This is battery prices that have gone down in 10 years by 89%. And you see that, you know, this is for lithium ion battery, the cost per kilowatt hour has gone down significantly. And as a result, what you see is electric vehicles becoming more affordable and more accessible in the um, international market. And that's definitely going to play um, a role in our market as well. And this is um, EV sales um, in 2020. And again, this is from the EV outlook of 2021. And they basically say that within vans and trucks, about 1% of the sale is electric. In passenger cars, that's four times higher, 4%. In buses, that's almost four, 10 times higher than that, 39%. And in two, three wheelers, it's 40%, 44%. And the size of the global fleet is already 216 million. So if you just look at this picture, a couple of slides ago, I said that what is lagging behind in, in Nepal is buses and two wheelers. But if you look at this picture globally, Buses and two wheelers, um, there's a big share of electrification in that segment. So I think there's a possibility for that in Nepal as well. And basically, um, the outlook also says that by mid century, by, sorry, by mid decade, um, 2025, 2026, there's going to be price parity. Or in other, words, in other words, the cost of electric owning an electric vehicle is going to be almost the same. Um, buying an electric vehicle, not just owning it, um, is almost going to be the same as buying a fossil fuel vehicles. So that will also drive the market. Um, we also need to, when we talk about electric mobility, we also need to talk about electric um, trains. In Nepal, there are many plans and you can see several plans here, the, the East-West Railway, um, along with the link railways that connect various towns with the East-West Railway. There's the proposed um, railway connecting um, Kathmandu and Rapsol. There's also a proposed railway connecting um, Lumbini, Kathmandu, and Raswagadi. And of course, they, we, there's always also talk about, about a metro system in Kathmandu. But a lot of this, you know, it's in the plans, but the progress has been quite slow. So particularly for freight transport, this would have been a great um, initiative for Nepal. Unfortunately, it's been very slow though. So overall, if you look at the situation of electric mobility in Nepal, um, look at it from five perspective, policy, governance, technology and markets, financial financing and resources and knowledge management. Challenges, yes, there are policies and but there are some conflicting policies and targets. And um, Mr. Shivari Sarkota later is gonna talk more about policies, so I'll not get great into detail. Um, the policies lack implementations, they lack plans and investments in it. And there's stand, lack of standards for electric mobility, for testing electric vehicles and so on. On the opportunity size, like I said, there are some good policies. The second national development in national determined contributions that Nepal submitted to UNFCCC has targets related to EVs in it. Um, and now the government has reduced custom and duty. So there are some opportunities there as well. Governance, overall public transportation system management is poor. Institutional structure lacking for electric vehicles and coordination is lacking. There's also a transport authority bill that's coming, you know, a bill in parliament that will establish a transport authority. Local governments are taking some initiatives. We will hear later on in the um, panel discussion. Um, province and municipalities particularly um, interested in EVs. Technology challenge. So far, there's very limited vehicle models available in the market. Charging infrastructure is not there yet. And most importantly, probably consumer confidence and demand is still 
you know, fairly low. On the positive side, technology is improving, price is falling globally. NEA already started, you know, putting charging stations and some Nepali entrepreneurs already getting into EVs or even making them, making EVs here or, or assembling them. Financing. There is a lack of financing mechanism to support electric vehicles. We don't have a uniform policy for financing, um, just like most other countries would have. Uh, particularly in the public transport sector, we don't have enough inv in investment coming from the government in particular. And human resource is also a challenge. On the opportunity side, pollution tax, through which we could you know, earn three, four billion rupees easily in a year, which is basically tax charged on uh, fossil fuels, could finance EVs. Electricity supply in the country is increasing, which is great. And government has invested 3 billion rupees, which is about 25 million rupees, 25 million dollars in Sajayat for electric buses. Big challenge on knowledge management side, in insufficient data on transport, um, lack of data processing and dissemination, and insufficient research and development. On the opportunity sides, there are some local universities, Trivon University, Kathmandu Universities, that, um, and some institutions um, such as the National Innovation Center, which are starting to conduct some research. So overall, there are a lot of challenges, but I'd say there are some opportunities as well. If we can you know, take on these opportunities, we could do quite a bit in this sector. And among all these opportunities, I think the priority should be one, public transport, electric bus systems, investing in electric buses, and charging infrastructure. Electric two-wheeler, urban freight, that could go rapidly into um, electrification. And that would be very benefit beneficial because, for example, these, um, you know, now there's a lot of delivery companies that are providing deliveries in cities and then cover a lot of kilometers each day. And so if you can electrify that sector, that would be, you know, really good. And even if you look at policies in India, a lot of, you know, policies, for example, the Delhi electric vehicle policy, focuses on the this urban freight sector as well and want they want to make it totally electric by 2024 and the third thing is the public procurement government has to invest in electric vehicles government has to buy electric vehicles this particular picture you see nepal electricity authority investing in 15 motorbikes just recently um, it's a small investment but a very important one and we hope others will join the bandwagon as well and the whole reason for all of this is just as an example, we, we, this is a you know study that we had GGGI had done together with us um, almost five years ago to compare the cost of a diesel bus, uh, Viking bus, which is basically what we have in Sajayata with um, electric buses. These are UID buses, and these are estimates we had at that time. The cost has come down quite a bit, but still, you see that the acquisition cost of acquisition is very high. Okay. But if you include the cost of economic cost, social cost, environmental cost, which is almost the cost of the total cost of the electric bus, okay, then it's not very high. But that cost is something that the society, that benefit really is what society gets from investing in electric vehicles. So that is, should be um, enough reasons for the government to put some subsidy on electric buses, particularly for um, public transport. And I think this study also clearly shows the need for government investment in public buses. So overall, I would say that Nepal has a national action plan for electric mobility and an NDC that in a supports has targets for electric mobility. The challenge for us is to implement it. And in that, there are three major components that he talks about. One is an institutional structure. We need an institution to promote electric mobility, a financing vehicle to finance um, various types of um, support that man, um, electric vehicle users, bus operators, or even manufacturers would need. And third would be a national program for electric mobility that is um, continuous over at least three years so that people can plan and um, invest accordingly. I would say prioritize in two wheelers and buses, two wheelers because that's 79% of our vehicle fleet, buses because they travel all day in the city and that's buses um, do emit a lot of diesel, you know, they consume a lot of diesel and emit a lot of carbon dioxide and pollutants as well. So public transport and two wheelers should be the priority. Standards required for um, different types of e-vehicles, um, chargers, and retrofitting 
and also testing protocols are required, and that should be done by the government ASAP. Um, as I said earlier, public procurement should be mandated, and the use of EVs in key sectors should be mandated, such as urban freight, ride sharing, taxis, um, and overall information and data management should be a priority. Thank you very much. I will end here. Um, and I will translate my own presentation in Nepali in one, one you know, minute. So, I will say that I have a question in English. I will say that I have a question in Nepali. I will say that I have a question in Nepali. I will say that I have a question in Nepali. हाम्रो भन्नु न रोड बेस्ड ट्रान्सपोर्ट छ र त्यसमा पनि धेरै जसो निजी सवारी साधन छ अम सार्वजनिक सवारी साधनहरुको संख्या त एकदमै घटेको छ विद्युतीय सवारी साधनहरु भन्ने हो भने करिब करिब 1% छ र त्यसको पनि 80% भनेको तीन पाङ्ग्रे छ तर सम्भावना छ यो वर्ष नै ठ्याकै हाम्रो चाहिँ बजेट भाषणमा चाहिँ हाम्रो अम भन्सार दर कम गर्ने बित्तिकै विद्युतीय सवारीमा डिमान्ड बढ्या छ तर कानेर बढ्या छ भने छैन धेरै भन्दा खेरि यो दुई पाङ्ग्रेमा र हाम्रो पब्लिक ट्रान्सपोर्ट सार्वजनिक यातायातमा बढ्या छैन त्यसैले त्यहाँनेर इन्भेस्ट गर्नुपर्ने छ नेपाल सरकारले नेशनल एक्शन प्लान फर इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी भनेर पनि ल्याइसकेछ त्यसमा तीनटा कुरा छ मेनली हैन त्यसको एउटा चाहिँ इलेक्ट्रिक व्हिकल लाई नै प्रवर्तन गर्नको लागि संस्थागत संरचना बन्नु पर्यो त्यसैगरी पनि त्यसलाई आर्थिक सहयोग दिनको लागि एउटा कुनै संरचना हुनु पर्छ र साथसाथै एउटा कार्यक्रम हुनु पर्छ भन्या छ त्यसमा लगानी गर्ने हो भने Electric bus or deep angle like promote got new money, standard her bona new money, rock sarkar affili. Electric guardi or kin new money, ra is some money, um suchana, tata data management malagani got new money, yes sector money, there are bona such. Thank you. Thank you, Gushan. Uh from your presentation, I also had a lot of, of takeaways, no? So you know there have been some progress as we saw but uh, there are challenges for example there are policies uh, launched but implementation is weak there have been pilots in, even on e-buses but we still need to have a more holistic uh, program uh, set forth now uh, we also see evs becoming more affordable um, globally we see e-buses and electric two and three wheelers being electrified and with pilots also starting on on e-buses and electric wheelers in in Nepal that also presents an opportunity to take the lessons learned uh, to move forward. You also talk a lot about uh, the opportunities to support this transition in Kathmandu uh, in Nepal, such as you know, the governance for public transport that is now being planned to be improved. Uh, a lot of untapped opportunities also lie in the policies uh, in contributing to financing this transition like the pollution tax. Uh, and indeed, the government has to invest also in EVs. Uh, in other cities, we see this occurring with city governments also demonstrating their uh, leadership with transitioning the municipal fleets, uh, for example. No, uh, It's good to talk a bit about the policies. Uh, next, the presentation will actually dive deeper in the EV policies in Nepal, so that's a perfect uh, transition. Uh, with that, I would like now to introduce uh, Mr. Shiva. Uh, Mr. Shiva is the Joint Secretary and, and Chief of uh, Infrastructure Development and Transport Division at the Ministry of Physical Infrastructure and Transport. So he has over 27 years of experience working in the government, and his specific focus is policy making for the transport sector development, uh, facilitating the uh, Department of Roads, uh, transport management, uh, railways, and shipping. Uh, he also handles road safety issues uh, with close coordination with the engineering councils. Uh, distinguished personalities, uh, organizer of the program and all participants, good afternoon. Ms. Sivari Sakota, Joint Secretary, MOPIT. Uh, in Nepal, uh, if we talk about the national road network, we have nearly 15,000 kilometers of roads. Uh, in it is in different province I, I have mentioned here and other roads in province and local nearly 100,000 kilometers we have already uh, constructed. Uh, out of this uh, nearly 15,000 kilometers, only 7,000 kilometer roads are blacked up and other are are done and blacked uh, gravel road. 500 kilometers under construction and 3,000 kilometers under plan. The population influence is 2,370 percent per, uh, per kilometer of roads and the road density is 7.58 kilometers per 
100 kilometer square. It is, uh, we are taken from the national highway uh, uh, length. The historical trend already, Bhushanji uh, mentioned this trend of the vehicle registration. But the domination of registration is two wheelers. Nearly about 80% of the uh, weight is goes to two wheelers. So it is already mentioned by Bhushanji. Yes, it, it mentioned the weightage of all types of vehicles registered in Nepal. Uh, very little in public buses, uh, then minibus, mini truck, uh, all these are very, very minimum, but only we have traffic in motorcycle, nearly 80% registration is two wheelers. Now I want to mention in here, uh, and I want to share some policies and provisions related to electric mobility in Nepal. The first is the constitution of Nepal, part three, section three zero of Nepal's constitution, right to clean and a healthy environment. It is the fundamental right of every Nepali citizen. So it is the guiding principle to go forward in electric mobility. The recently we are uh, going through 15th five-year plan, uh, which is already uh, in board. Uh, chapter 8 of the 15th five-year plan deals with infrastructure and section 8, one is related to energy. One of the three objectives related, related to energy is to reduce the import of petroleum products. The working policy related, related to energy include fixing an appropriate tariff for EV and establishing charging stations for EV. Section 8.2 of the plan deals with transportation under which Section 8.2.1 focuses on roads. Section 8.2.3 on railways and Section 8.2.5 on transport management. The vision for transport management is competitive, safe, and environment-friendly transportation system that are accessible for all. The strategy includes emphasize sustainable and environment-friendly transport system. Furthermore, the working policies include emphasize mass transit and bus rapid transit, and prioritize electric vehicles, and encourage local governments and cooperatives to invest in public transport and effectively regulate the private sector. The next policy is Kathmandu Valley Air Quality Management Action Plan 2020. Uh, the cabinet approved the Kathmandu Valley Air Quality Management Action Plan, which has listed promotion of electric vehicle as one of four measures to reduce vehicular pollution with following activities. Within one year, establish charging stations and bus terminals with charging facilities. Within two years, develop legal measures for the conversion of all vehicles to EV. Within five years, operate only zero emission vehicles in tourist and culturally sensitive areas. The next one is National Transport Policy 2001, list of following activities related to e-mobility, e that is solar power and electric, uh, electricity driven transport means throughout the country. Uh, the next one is uh, the custom and tax incentive to promote private private sector, involvement in the construction, maintenance, and rehabilitation of transport infrastructure, and to encourage non-polluting vehicles. The next one is environment friendly vehicle and transport policy 2014. It has already mentioned that uh, in 2020, we have to raise in 20% by 2020, it is already gone, promote the conversion of other vehicles to EV and provide uh, subsidies for the promotion of EVs. The improvement in transport practices and technologies all these things are already mentioned in 2014 also. The next one is environment friendly vehicle and transport policy 2014. The next uh, national action plan for electric mobility 2018 aims to set a path of achievement of the electric mobility target adopted, adopted by the NDC. Four key barriers, policy and governance, infrastructure and markets, financing and resources and data and monitoring. Three priority actions are establishing unit for electric mobility. For example, in Mopit, we can establish a unit for facilitating the electric vehicles, national program for electric mobility, financing mechanism for electric mobility. The plan proposes a total of 24 initiatives, which are activities with limited scope and respond to address the identified barriers. Next one is Ministry of Energy, Water Resources and Irrigation so White Paper 2018 introduced appropriate policies and charging stations to increase the use of electric vehicles so that by 2023, half of the vehicles imported into the country are electric. 
Now I want to uh, talk about the budget space of 2021, 22 by 2031, light vehicles petroleum will be replaced by electric vehicles, converted vehicle to be exempted from annual vehicle tax and annual road maintenance costs for five years. The government of Nepal will operate at least 100 units of electric buses within Kathmandu Valley through PP, 500 charging stations will be set up within this fiscal year. Some fiscal incentives through budget 2021-22. There are some custom duties relaxation, road construction taxes, uh, increase in road construction taxes. So for example, 5% of the vehicle's price for four-wheeler CV up to 10%, RS uh, 10,000 for two-wheelers and three-wheelers electric vehicles, 15,000 to 1 lakhs for two-wheelers for uh, other category of vehicles. There, are, there is a VAT for, for all. 13% pollution taxes initially 0.5 rupees per liter of diesel petrol sold, but increased to RS 1.5 in 2020, uh, 2019, 20, and 2021-22. Uh, Infrastructure development taxes also there. 10 per liter diesel and petrol. Road maintenance and improvement fee also there. Toll will be waived for five years for those converted EVs. Government will operate 100 big electric buses within Kathmandu Valley with, through PPP. Uh, these are some, uh, some fiscal year budget address to promote the electric vehicles. Similarly, Bagmati Province uh, Financial Act 2078 uh, elaborated about the transport vehicle uh, annual tax, motorcycle up to 125cc to above 650cc, for example, 30,000, electric motorcycle from 2,000 to 3,000, uh, if it is petrol, diesel, it is 22,000 to 65,000. If it is electric vehicle, 15,000 to 30,000. Here I want to say about the Paris Agreement Emission Mechanism and uh, Implementation, 2020, the Enhanced Second NDC, 2021, COP26, Glasgow, 2023, Global Stock Take, take Stock of the implementation of Paris Agreement, including NDCs to access the collective progress 2025 updated new NDC outline and communicate climate action plans while enhancing the emission over time. 2028 global stock take and 2030 updated new NDC and 2050 the zero emission. This is the target. E-mobility components in Nepal's second NDC. As Gosanji told, sales of electric vehicles in 2025 will be 25% of all private passenger vehicle sales, including two wheelers, and 20% of all four wheelers uh, public passenger vehicle sales. By 2030, increased sales of e vehicles to cover 90% of all private passenger um, vehicle sales, including two wheelers, and 60% of all four wheelers public passenger vehicle sales. By 2030, developed 200 kilometers of the electric rail network to support public commuting, commuting and mass transportation of goods. Now I want to say uh, where we have to go. First of all, we have to disseminate all the issues of electric vehicles with concerning stakeholders. The next one is awareness campaign among private and public vehicles owner, including two wheelers also. And next one is cover all these electric vehicles policies in upcoming vehicle transport management act and regulation. These are the things which actually I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shiva. Um, it's interesting to see uh, the NDC starting to be integrated in the uh, e-mobility, I mean, starting to be integrated in the NDC of Nepal. I think what is also uh, rather important that you have pointed out, uh, that you have presented, is that there are all, actually uh, the government had already started, um, you know, coming up with policies and incentives to promote the engagement, involvement of the private sector. Uh, of course, we have a lot of them in the session, and that's something I, I would say that you know there's probably a need to um, dissect and digest what uh, what these. Uh, policies are what these incentives are to spur the the supply because earlier the, we, in the earlier presentation we also see you know the demand are rising but there's still not enough supply so uh, perhaps uh, you know I, I hope that uh, there would be continued engagement uh, with the various stakeholders as you have pointed out in your way forward for this transition and I would like to ask uh, Bushan would you be providing a brief summary of this uh, now, or would we wait after the session, after the next presentation?
if we can yeah if, if that is uh, not yet possible for this uh, session we can do that perhaps after a uh, CME presents so um, I would like to welcome next uh, uh, Simi Shashi she is the coordinator and project manager at uh, Center for Heritage Environment and Development so it's an institution and an under the Kochi Municipal Corporation and uh, we'll Take a look first about the case in India. Uh, she will uh, guide us through the national and the local level. So some might have questions on how is how are other countries doing it, like with the national and the uh, basically the vertical integration of the different uh, immobility policies. So let's hear uh, from Ms. Simi. Uh, Ms. Simi, the mic is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And I will be uh, throwing some light on the national state and uh, city level actions, uh, especially from uh, the experiences of Kochi will be shared uh, during this uh, short presentation of mine. So we'll go into the presentation first. So the uh, Indian automotive industry has uh, grown multifold in the past few years, owing to a rapid urbanization, large millennial population, increasing highway and infrastructure investment and other factors. So with this increase, uh, the Indian electric vehicle market has also seen growth through government regulations and uh, investment outlays, especially in the areas of uh, affordability and uh, charging infrastructure. The uh, National Mission on Electric Mobility, which is a national level program launched in 2011, aimed to provide uh, government support on all matters related to EV and uh, create a synergistic method for long-term commitment and ownership among the stakeholders involved in the program. So soon after that, in 2015, we had the FAME one, which was launched by the Department of Heavy Industries to increase the focus on manufacturing of electric and hybrid vehicles with the scheme running from uh, April 2015 to March 2019. And an allocated budget of uh, rupees 895 crores was uh, sanctioned for this uh, project. In 2018-19, uh, FAME 2 was launched which was an extension of the FAME one with increased allocation of funds over a period of three years, which led to the rise of a national electric mobility mission plan in 2020. And that targeted about six to 7 million units of new vehicle sales of EV and about two to 2.5 million tons of fuel savings. Now with the success of FAME one and the uh, natural initiation of FAME two, Few Indian states, including Kerala, have established their own EV policy. So uh, the uh, EV policy in Kerala was launched in 2019 with an aim to ensure sustainable development for its people. The state being known for its biodiversity and environment sensitiveness needs the transition to electric vehicle as a natural choice in line with the development ethos of the state. The number of private vehicles on road is expected to reduce with the introduction of shared e-mobility modes like e-buses and e-rickshaws that will provide a, a fatigue-free ride with reduced vibration and noise. This shall also act as a very important key driver in attracting vehicle owners to shift to electric mobility. It's also envisioned that KCP, the Kerala State Electricity Board, shall cater to the power demand and the state government shall ensure EV infrastructure, such as charging points, low power tariffs to ensure affordability, etc. The development of e-mobility must be integrated to the manufacturing ecosystem of the state, whereby the large number of startups and initiatives can be pooled and utilized towards development of the e-mobility initiative. So we have, what are the major important key policy drivers uh, for the state? The uh, Kerala EV policy aims to support the national commitment to reduce the GHG through its strategies. The other vision for Kerala EV policy includes promoting shared mobility and clean transportation by provision of e-buses and e-rickshaws, thereby reducing the dependency on private modes of transport and in turn improving the air quality. The policy also intends to boost the operational efficiency and savings for the transport sector as well as the transport utility. The policy also strategically intends to boost the hardware and software manufacturing in the state. Uh, the state level initiatives, uh, uh, the above, uh, the aforementioned objectives and visions 
uh, in order to achieve uh, those, a technical advisory committee uh, called as the e-mobility state level task force has been set up by the state government to initiate, develop, and sustain e-mobility in the state. This committee scrutinizes the technology adoption and manufacturing proposals in the area and recommends to the government for adoption of the same. In addition, uh, the state government has also constituted a steering committee for the smooth implementation of EV roadmap. The committee will, you know, in a random review and rectify the progress of the plans and will provide necessary course corrections. It is noteworthy to mention here that the Kerala Road Transport Corporation has been sanctioned 250 e buses under the FAME 2 for intra city operations. And uh, cities like Trivandrum have already started operations on a pilot basis. The state has been driving towards faster and immense adoption of EV through its policies and schemes. In order to ensure this fast adoption, certain strategies are being followed at the state level. Some of the implemented actions uh, at the state levels include uh, sanctioning of rupees 9 crores for charging infrastructure. The uh, Kerala State Electricity Board Limited is a state nodal agency responsible for establishing charging infrastructure in the state. A support scheme for early adoption, including fiscal incentives like reduced road tax, incentives of rupees 30 to 35,000 or 25% of the EV cost, whichever is lower, creation of uh, e mobility zones to familiarize uh, with uh, the public on immobility aspects, demonstration hubs will, uh, within the selected areas of certain region, categorizing them as uh, immobility zones. The potential areas includes, you know, tourist villages or the central business de development areas within Kochi and other works like first and last mile connectivity for urban transportation networks. Apart from that, uh, they're also focusing on bus permit issuance. Permits will be issued for company vehicles and buses for employee transportations and uh, to IT part, et cetera, which will constitute a larger portion of commuters in Kochi. Human capacity building and reskilling is another uh, idea that's being thought about in the policy. The state government shall establish uh, centers of excellence for various components of EVs, including battery technology, software development, charging technologies, etc. So, uh, coming to Kochi, uh, the uh, scenario within Kochi is uh, the city of Kochi is uh, the largest urban agglomeration in the state, um, which is strategically located with the dense network of raid and road and rail connectivity, as well as water and air transport availability. As per the data provided by the Kerala State Pollution Control Board, the particular matter, the PM10 at monitoring locations is highest owing to the ongoing construction activities and high traffic density. The air quality studies indicate that the city needs to aggressively promote public and non-motorized transport as part of the city's urban development plan along with the shift to clean up your vehicles. Thus, with this picture in mind, backed by various mobility plans that has already been developed for city, like the city mobility plan and the integrated public transportation system, um, um, plan for Greater Kochi, as well as keeping in mind the national and state level vision for EV adoption in Kerala, the Kochi Municipal Corporation has introduced certain initiatives, certain noteworthy initiatives towards encouraging e-mobility. The uh, city level initiative in Kochi towards e-mobility, that's what this uh, slide is all about. Um, IPT and uh, auto rickshaws are one of the major modes of commute that constitutes about 8% of the model share and about 4,500 vehicles is highly used for achieving first and last mile connectivity for commuters. Thus, uh, the Kochi Municipal Corporation has uh, rightly tapped in the IPT vehicles for electrification of their fleet thereby ensuring reducing reduced pollution levels and cleaner mode of transportation. It was in 2019 that the Kochi Metro Rail Limited facilitated the formation of the Ernakulam Jilla Auto Rickshaw Drivers Cooperative Society, a first of its kind umbrella body in the district, which unified six uh, trade unions affiliated to various uh, political parties to streamline the IPT operations in Kochi. Now, EJAX is operating the e-autos as a feeder to Kochi Metro, Metro on a rental basis as of now. So the Kochi Municipal Corporation is now empowering EJAX to pro procure and uh, launch fleet-based network of e-autos 
operating along fixed routes that's been identified and that connect residential as well as institutional zones with uh, PT stations, ensuring affordable and reliable IPT services to Kochi citizen. The society is also on the way to purchase its first batch of EOTOs with the subsidy offered by the local and the state governments. And of course, yes, we are also having funding support from the UN Habitat and GIC supported uh, smart SUT project. And this whole engagement uh, for e-vehicles, the idea of having e-vehicles all began for Kochi with the urban pathways project. And, and it, is, it is as of now proce proceeding well over the years. The Auto Rickshaw Society have also developed an app which is aimed at providing real-time information and offering trip planning and life tracking information to the passengers. About 1,000 drivers have been dropped in to be a part of this OSA app, as it is called, and they aim to convert all the 25,000 members, drivers of EJAX, to an environment-friendly vehicles. So uh, we're just not talking about the uh, passenger movement. We're also thinking about converting freight. So movement of freight cannot be ignored, you know, while talking about a vehicular movement in Kochi. The, the Broadway and the Ernakulam, these are the two major uh, areas within the city where we have the, uh, the local commercial market. There are major hotspots for freight movement in the city that sees as, as high as 1,500 good vehicles on a daily basis at locations like Mother Pharmacy Junction and uh, Hospital Trust Junction. These are local junctions for which we have the high uh, inflow of uh, goods vehicle. Given this high volume of uh, freight movement and in turn the increased pollution and emission caused by these vehicles, the Kochi Municipal Corporation, with a view to address this pressing issue, introduced a new policy for freight transport to build strategies and policy in association with the Ecologistics Project through International Climate Initiative to promote low carbon and a more sustainable urban freight through local action and national support. Thus, uh, the city, with the support from German Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety, is planning for a pilot implementation of electric three-wheelers, cargo vehicles, which is proposed under the Ecologistics projects that is being implemented in Kochi. So in a nutshell, uh, before I, I, I will, I'll just have to add a few more words, it can be you know, concluded that the need for a, a multi-prolonged and multi-phased implementation roadmap needs to be realized and initiatives have to be taken up in place in policy level as well as implementation level, though so, uh, they are largely on a pilot basis. However, scaling up of these feasible proposals needs to be taken up in cities on priority basis so that the larger goal of attaining a carbon neutral city can be achieved. Let's conjointly hope, uh, I can only talk about Kochi, so Kochi will be able to showcase a model example to other cities on best practices towards el electrification of, of vehicles. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Simi. Uh, you talk a, a bit about uh, Kerala and also in what can be implemented at, at that level. No? So um, interesting to hear about the e-mobility zones um, in, uh, in ecologically sensitive areas. Um, I, I remember in one of our partner cities, that is also what they are trying to learn no? in, in, in Hanoi, in trying to explore what are the opportunities in low emission zones. Um, and, and one point that you also mentioned is that there are there have been bodies that have been created at the uh, at the state level or at the local level like in in Kerala there was a, a task an immobility state level task force um uh, to sustain the immobility e initiatives and there's also if I understand correctly a steering committee you know for developing the EV roadmap and then we hear from from Kochi an example of how the the trade unions were also unified with the cooperative society so uh, I think in a lot of cities that is also always a challenge uh, to bring these stakeholders together uh, in in also in, in one of the partner cities we're testing this uh, with you know setting up this the committee to to drive this uh, immobility transition forward. Um, before uh, we go to uh, the question and answer, perhaps I'd like to invite uh, Bushan if you would like to join me as a co-moderator and see if uh, there's a need to um, summarize that briefly. I'm having problems with my internet, so um, I just got on my mobile phone and um, I just try to 
stay connected through here. Mafkan uh, untuk mero internet malah kita sama siapa kau le? Mungkin pula itu sunnah payah. Tapi malah kita Nepal ini macam cerita macam tu pentron gani kreasi kerjau. Siwa riset leh je Nepal kah niti niem baru baru dalam malah kita kurang gunu bahkiu. Bisnes gari kena NDC ko kurang. Tesis gari kena ane niti harus junca. Abah oleh kecunauti bani ko tes baru macam jen tiada bibiti gani sama ni nikah harus kau tengi kau dihana kerjakan gani. Tetapi lagi kari main gani. Raa tes pasi koci ko. बाट ऐसी निजी ले प्रतिति गनु बात है और तेज में तीन ता तहा को सरकार का तीन तहा कई अम नीति नियम मरी बारी करा गनु को संघीय सरकार को अम दस बस अगाडी देखी नहीं नेशनल मिशन ऑन इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी बने रहा इसे कैसा भारत को तेज गरी का ना छह बस अगाडी फेम वन बने रहा था अम तेज गरी तीन बस अगाडी फेम टू बने रहा था फेम बना ले फास्टर अडॉप्शन एंड के लिए मैन्युफैक्चरिंग ऑफ इलेक्ट्रिक एंड हाइब्रिड व्हीकल्स हो तो यहाँ को चाहिए अम तेज ले कति अम पैसा के लिए दिने अनुदान में दिने इत्यादि सब ही पूरा आरु बन्चा कति लगानी करने सब ही बन्चा र तेज गरी का ना अगाड़ी बढ़ाने को लाई सहयोग करता है रस साथ साथ है हर एक बस दस हजार वड़ा के लिए इलेक्ट्रिक सॉरी हजार वड़ा इलेक्ट्रिक बस ले आने पर नहीं उन्हें ले टारगेट लिया था जल्दी करता है कि 2025 समय 6000 इलेक्ट्रिक बस ले आने टारगेट करें था रा 9 करोड़ रुपया तक चार्जिंग स्टेशन में लगानी करें विद्युतीय परिवहन लाई प्रबंधन कर रहा है कुछ है जैसे लिए तीन तेज सरकार ले मिले रह काम करता केरी के सही के ही भय रह कुछ जस्ते देखें जब भारत में हम लेबन ते ते के ते ते तेरा सोचने पड़ने जस्ते देखें जब जाने बात थैंक यू क्या थैंक यू बुशाइन देर आर अ कपल ऑफ क्वेश्चंस दैट वी वुड ऑलरेडी लाइक ट� um, there are a couple of questions I see that are also addressed to you, Abushan, uh, but we can take first the ones addressed to Mr. Shiva. Uh, is there a dedicated entity, uh, Mr. Shiva, this is a question for you, uh, is there a dedicated entity to track the progress and everything related to electric mobility in Nepal? Shiva Rishab Kutaji, I don't know if he's there or not, but um, if I can answer, I'll just say no, there's no dedicated um, institution responsible, the Department of Transport Management and the Ministry of Physical Infrastructure and Transport is responsible for overall transport management, but for EV sector in general, um, not that I'm aware of, and I've had discussions with this on this with the MOPIT several times, and um, they want to do it, but they haven't been able to do it so far. Okay. Um, and this is also uh, addressed uh, to Mr. Shiva, but you could also give your insights. Like, would you know if there are policies to provide uh, cash discounts, uh, cash discount incentive, um, like the one in India for purchasing EVs? Um, no, then there, there isn't, it's except for the custom duty exemption um, and the excise duty exemptions, which is taken by the, um, you know, the company that imports um, the benefit is there, and if he, the importing company passes that benefit to the consumer, the consumer gets it, but there's no cash mm -hmm. subsidy like in India. In India, for example, there is for, you know, depending on the capacity of the um, electric vehicle, there are different um, incentives you can get based if you're a two, if you buy a two wheeler, three wheeler, four wheeler, a bus, um, there are different categories as determined by fame, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. and also you know, there are incentives provided by the you know, central government as well as the provincial government, as well as sometimes by city government. So there are three levels of incentives provided. Nepal doesn't have any of that. And that's why we're looking for a financing vehicle to make things like that happen. Yeah, um, and now I have a question for Miss Simi. Is she still? Yeah, okay, she's still with us. Uh, my question is related to the the bodies that have been created. For example, the task force. Uh, what is the general composition of the the committees like that? Are they um, like interagency at the local level or in in Kochi or uh, yeah in Kochi? Uh, no, in Kerala. I think that was in Kerala. And uh, what has been the response of those that have been invited um, to be part of this task force? Um, so, um, so um, at the state level, uh, we would probably have, we are having the government secretary, the chief minister, the ministry for transportation, and uh, the concerned uh, secretaries who are heading the departments. So, uh, uh, and there will be a regular steering committee meeting that's actually called up. 
um, um, on a regular basis. And uh, at the city level, it, that's the most important and the you know the most uh, difficult uh, steering committee that we have. Uh, it, the mayor is actually chairing the committee, and we have the various trade unions. And of course, there's the cooperative society, which will be represented by the president, uh, the secretary, and other uh, agencies like the PWD, the Public Works Division, the Roads Department. There is what we call the Greater Kochi Development Authority, uh, the GCDA. So we have various uh, independent uh, authorities and agencies. So the, the committee that's formed at the at the city level consists of all these uh, inter-allied agencies. So yeah, that's what basically the city city committee is about. Yes. Ah, interesting. Um, and now I, I want to move towards like one and uh, perhaps a different sector now. So on the road transport, and this is for Bushan now. Um, is the current road structure feasible for EVs? So this is a more general, I guess, question on the general EVs. Uh, what do you think about the road infrastructure? Um, I wouldn't say all the roads in, in, in the country are suitable for EVs. Some of the roads, as has been said by um, you know, Joint Secretary Sapkota as well. A lot of the roads are, are rough roads, which may not be suitable. A lot of the EVs that are in the market right now mm -hmm. um, are, um, you know, have very little clearance, for example. And so, you know, they may not be suitable, but for the most part, I think, um, you know, the roads are suitable. The, 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 the main highways, the urban roads, they are suitable for EVs. And now a lot of EVs coming to Nepal have also, are also coming in with fairly high clearance that are more suitable for Nepali roads. And then the experience is that you know, it can manage the uphill and downhills um, fairly easily um, in, in, in a city government, in city environment, particularly. And um, is, for example, with, when it comes to like, um, like uh, going back to the, the roles of uh, perhaps Mopit, uh, there have been questions about, um, I would say, the roles and responsibilities of different agencies. And so um, perhaps the one that we could check first is on the uh, whose role would it be to you know to, to push the promotion of EVs and not really the, the formulation of plans and policies if I understand it uh, correctly so uh, what is the um, exact role of, of Mopit in terms of the EV promotion and is that uh, falling under the Mopit's uh, uh, mandate uh, well, maybe overall we should... Overall, MOPIT's mandate includes, you know, transport um, management in the country and therefore, and also within its mandate is to promote eco-friendly transport. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are many different agencies that are responsible, Department of Environment and, um, you know, Nepal Oil Corporation and so on. And that's why, you know, what Simi talked about earlier, this coordination committee, the steering committee at the city level chaired by the mayor is extremely important. I think that is what would get everybody in the, on the same boat and, and start paddling in the same directions. Mm -hmm. um, so what they have in, in Kochi, I think, is brilliant. And, and also in, in the state of Kerala, at the state level, steering committee, um, it's, it's a, it, that's what we need, and that's what we need to make it effective. Um, there are multiple agencies that are responsible, and they all need to be you know, pulling in the same direction, and we need leadership for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the insight, Bushan. Um, you know, in, in our experience also in working with, with cities on uh, immobility, uh, both at the national and local level, we also realized that uh, the the role of promoting EVs doesn't really just fall on the one uh, agency. Like for example, the transport agency, we have them uh, also in this session, a later hill from the Philippines. Um, and there's a lot of other stakeholders that are important in pushing this. So we are working even with uh, the trade and industry, um, look, making sure that the policies are also friendly for the suppliers, uh, for the manufacturers and importers, uh, and the local startups. How are we um, like, uh, how are we boosting their uh, capacity you know, in terms of, of su supplying this electric two and three meter demand in the Philippines and, and jeepneys? Um, and on the other hand, we also work with uh, environment uh, agencies. They also have uh, here, at least, you know, they have a, 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 a specific division that is talking about uh, more, more folks about the, the awareness and campaigning and on air quality. So we also involve them uh, heavily on this. Uh, before I, I go further on uh, the stakeholder organization, I believe that um, we will have to uh, let one of our, our uh, session, uh, our panelists uh, go. So Mrs. Simi is uh, also um, 
has kindly shared with us her insights on Kochi. And unfortunately, we are not able to have her throughout the session. So, um, Ms. Simi, uh, thank you so much for your contribution to this session. And again, uh, you know, we learned a lot and we hope that uh, there will be more uh, discussions going forward with you or, uh, with, with Kochi and Kerala and a lot of hey. uh, Lord. Thank you so I much, Ms. Simi. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank Next session, we'll talk a little bit more about the planning. So you've heard a, a lot of discussions on planning. And uh, for the next two, we'll have first uh, Dr. Oliver La. Uh, he is going to uh, give us a brief overview of like the National Urban Mobility Program, uh, the formulation, the implementation, this process. Uh, Oliver is the head of the Mobility International Cooperation Research Unit at Wuppertal Institute. And he coordinates the Urban Electric Mobility Initiative and the EU funded Solutions Plus project. So with that, uh, Oliver, uh, the mic is yours. Thank you. So the, the idea of the National Urban Mobility Policies and Programs is basically just one way of uh, uh, capturing the idea of synchronizing uh, policies across the national level, but also across the national and local level. Um, so this is one approach that one could take. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter if you call it an NUMP or if you call it a national policy or strategy. It's just the basic idea of the synchronization of key policies to make sure that they are uh, complementary and uh, work well together to enable the transition. So we're touching uh, briefly on the key concept, on the role of NUMPs and some of the key components, then going to the actors and the NUMP cycle, just again as, a, as an idea to, um, to develop such a program, um, uh, then look, reflecting back on the wider policy context, so some concrete examples in general uh, of policies that need to go hand in hand. Um, and then uh, finishing with uh, some of the ideas uh, for, for the context in Nepal. Um, so this is something that we pulled together with our friends from Mobilize Your City. Um, and there is a little guideline available and some training specifically on the NUMP development. It is basically meant to uh, empower cities to coordinate between the local and the national governments and address some of the key barriers and aiming to harmonize policies and regulations across policy levels. Um, here, of course, it is quite vital that uh, to both sides, or you know, in many cases, there's also a state government in between as well. So all three levels of government that, that are relevant for national, local, and state transport policies and institutions and investment programs um, are at least as aligned as possible. Of course, this becomes very tricky when, for example, different uh, political actors um, are active at the different levels uh, who may not uh, necessarily have the same political agenda. So there, of course, um, a more longer term um, strategic environment can at least uh, create some level of continuity and stability. Um, so the basic idea of what we call an NUMP, but you know, it can have many names. It's just the basic idea that this is a strategic and action-oriented framework for mobility so that we make a direct uh, link between national policy, regulatory, fiscal environments and the implementation at the local level. And uh, particularly important uh, from that perspective is also the enhancement of uh, cap capabilities and capacities at the city level, which goes to the level of uh, um, actors and policies, uh, uh, advisors, planners at the local level who need support. Often, of course, there's quite an imbalance between the capacities that are available in different planning departments, in local authorities, as opposed to national governments. So there, um, in particular, of course, also for the uh, small and medium-sized cities, there is quite a lack of capacities at, at the local level. So ensuring that there is enough staff and enough capacities um, at the local level to develop and implement plans. But then, of course, also 
uh, uh, empowering uh, local authorities to have sufficient regulatory power and fiscal uh, 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 opportunities to invest in local infrastructure and mobility solutions is an important element. So that's the basic idea of the MUMP. And the way this uh, sort of interlinks between uh, the national and local level, as we said, uh, in, in many cases, there's also a state level in between. Um, is that of course policy and regulations directly affect the ability or not of local governments, for example, to raise funds, for example, to allow certain vehicles on the road. Um, there's of course a heavy reliance on national support for uh, investments into local infrastructure. Um, and then of course, in many cases, there's also a direct link between local and national uh, governments and investments uh, on um, uh, the debt repayment as well. Um, so linking, linking all that uh, is sort of the main idea of an MUMP. And um, of course, there can be different uh, ways to get to such an MUMP. Um, it can be a comprehensive approach where you basically develop a national urban mobility policy as an overarching uh, strategy for the sector to transform um, that has agreed concrete targets across the local and the national level that identifies specifically uh, regulatory policy and uh, financial frameworks um, uh, and links them between the levels of government and uh, uh, then spells out more specifically specific programs on the policy as well as on the investment side um, and uh, outlines uh, individual policies. It can be a patchwork of those. Um, very often that is the case and that can be a starting point. You can start with a more dedicated program toward the uh, boosting uh, the transformation of a bus sector, for example, or a development of a certain segment. Um, of uh, uh, sustainable mobility or electric mobility development. The key thing is, of course, that it is at least embedded into a wider structure and that over the longer term, you can bring those patchwork elements together to a more comprehensive uh, program and package because this is what really what we need for the more wider transformation of the sector. And um, some of the key Principles uh, are very similar to uh, what we have uh, used for many years also on the uh, local level around the sustainable urban mobility planning so that we prioritize people and focus on the quality of life, that all our actions are embedded into longer term visions with a clear focus and specific targets for the short and medium term um, that this is a tool. It's not just a paper that can be written by a consultant. It is for, first and foremost, a process to organize and coordinate actors, their objectives and their responsibilities. Uh, so uh, the coordination of uh, key institutions, we've, we've heard about that um, uh, already in the previous discussions and this is, um, one way of trying to bring this all together. And uh, when you develop a more longer term uh, strategic uh, document, that is also an opportunity to bring in uh, key stakeholders from outside government. Uh, and they're of course in, uh, private sector actors uh, from the vehicle industry, from the uh, public sector, uh, from the public uh, transport authorities, from uh, various trends of operators and startups, but then also even go beyond and turn this into a participatory process that um, uh, is wide open to public participation. And this can be a key tool to what we said in the beginning around the stability of such a long-term program. Because if there has been a wide participation from well beyond uh, party politics and well beyond the government of the day and one coalition at, at one level of government. Um, key stakeholders have brought in 
the participation goes into the public and the public likes it and uh, is, is committed to those uh, long-term targets, then you have a level of consensus and con consistency that gives you the longer term um, uh, stability that you need. And then of course, uh, you can also link that to international commitments from the state and, and national level as well. Um, uh, who takes action? So obviously there's no surprise here on who, who are key players uh, in that field. It can start with different uh, ministries and uh, you know being uh, an environmental guy I can probably say that that the angle purely from the environment perspective or the from the NDC from the um, uh, Ministry of the, for the environment um, may not necessarily be the strongest as the starting point so it would be highly desirable that Ministry of Transport, a Ministry of Finance, and of course, also, you know, if that sits within the Prime Minister's office or so, that can also be a, a helpful tool to coordinate other players, might be the better step for this wider transition of the sector. Environmental um, uh, aspects are, of course, a key uh, objective here, but access for all, safety, quality of life, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, also industrial development are key driving factors here. And this is where other more powerful um, uh, ministries within cabinet may be better placed to run this process than an environment ministry, for example. So that then you know, would of course include all the other uh, relevant uh, ministries around the, the table, but also civil society actors, academia, and then local governments, of course, and not just um, the big uh, powerhouses, but also the small and medium-sized cities cause the demands for uh, capacities, for their abilities to contribute might be quite different. And um, similar as you know it from the sustainable urban mobility planning, um, in UMP planning can go in, in, in a very similar cycle where you start with the wide mapping of uh, the key issues that need addressing, the key stakeholders need to, that need to be involved, um, and then develop the joint uh, process towards joint visions and goals, and then identify concrete measures that can be uh, implemented or that are implemented already that need to be better synchronized or that need uh, amendments later on in the process. And then, you take it from there into a more detailed preparation. And the reason why we need that is, is that the transport sector, as we know, is very scattered with regard to the different angles that you, um, you can uh, influence the sector and uh, drive the transition of the sector. Um, local and national policies uh, are key in that and not either one of them uh, can do it all by themselves. So of course, at the national level, uh, fiscal and regulatory uh, measures such as the taxation and regulation of the vehicle fleet are an important element, but also uh, enabling factors that uh, empower local authorities to raise funds at the local level, to plan, to invest at the local level, all of them go hand in hand. And if we look at the, the case from, um, from Nepal, so that we've heard quite a number of uh, key elements that fit already well into that context that, uh, that one could um, uh, link together to provide a more contextual framework in the context of an NUMP to align regulations, to ensure that there is co-funding for public transport operators, for example, to look into imports and capacity building, and if we look at that more specifically, then um, one could look at um, the existing uh, uh, regulatory and fiscal um, uh, incentives uh, or taxation environment, let's say, in, in Nepal, um, already quite prone to that kind of approach, where there is quite a good differentiation between um, uh, uh, fossil fuel powered vehicles and electric vehicles. 
um, where there is taken into account into the fuel tax uh, uh, already uh, a pollution element in that. And if you were to bring that together to a hypothecated fund so that you basically earmark the funds that are being generated through the different treatment of different types of vehicles and use that to reinvest in low carbon modes, but also then in the development of a local industry on e-mobility solutions, um, then Nepal could really become a powerhouse for, for e-mobility solutions uh, in South Asia and beyond, uh, in particular with innovative and fit for purpose, energy efficient, resource efficient vehicle concept such as the Safa Tempo, such as the logistics and two-wheeler vehicle concepts that we talked about, electric buses uh, uh, developed locally. So that can be a tool to develop a domestic uh, industry and that could be a great opportunity for Nepal as well. I hope I you know, uh, managed to share a few thoughts on, on a potential framework for, uh, for a national uh, policy uh, that can link local and national elements together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, yeah, indeed, you know, uh, the, this is a, a really comprehensive approach, but that would really aid you know, with the NUMP serving as a tool um, to organize and coordinate all the different actors as we have seen in your slides. And, and who takes action? As we have heard in earlier discussions and, and exchanges, you know, there, it's not just with the transport, but there are uh, the finance ministries, uh, urban development, environment, but also the it's also relevant to include in this uh, planning pro process the civil society, the private sector, the academic, and especially the local governments in all of the of types of different sizes, small, medium sized cities also have a different priorities and different, um, I would say, uh, capabilities in terms of implementing actions. You know? So, um, and then on the last point that you made, it's also important for us to uh, 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 understand or map out what are the measures that can be done at the national and the local level for each of right, the planning on the infrastructure, the incentives and the disincentives, the the regulations and information. Uh, so that would be important to have a process to aid this uh, coordination. So um, next, uh, I, I'd like to, uh, I'm happy to welcome uh, our Assistant Secretary Sheila from the Philippines uh, to share about like, how did we uh, try to implement the NUMB? How did it come about in the Philippines? Uh, with the, You've heard of the, the process earlier with the presentation of Oliver. So how do we, how have we, uh, develop this concept in the Philippines. So um, um, Asik Sheila is uh, currently the Assistant Secretary for Planning and, and Project Development of the Department of Transportation Philippines. She's also an Associate Professor of the, uh, at the UP, University of the Philippines School of Urban and Regional Planning. So she's uh, one of the core members of the Women in Transport Leadership Show. So she also has a lot of insights on the, the needs of the uh, of different sectors like women um, and other vulnerable groups. So her research interests include equitable transportation planning and integrating accessibility and gender issues in transport planning. So I'm happy to welcome her in this session. So Asik Sheila, the mic is yours. Thank you. Good. Evening, everybody from the Philippines. My task for this evening is to share with you what had been the experience of the Philippines in putting together the um, Philippine, Urba Philippine National Urban Mobility Program. I'll talk about why that has changed. But if you notice that um, it is included, if you notice that before the PU the Philippine National Urban Mobility Plan, you'd actually see Bayanihan. But what is Bayanihan? I'd like to just share with you that Bayanihan in the Philippines literally means being in a community. Hence, it involves the spirit of communal unity and cooperation. So that was actually the spirit on which the Philippine National Urban Mobility Plan or the POM was put together. So the outline of my, of my presentation would be I'd talk about the challenges in urban transport system in the Philippines, our way forward in doing the Philippine Urban Mobility Program, current interventions, which are actually also anchored on the pump, and 
a little bit about our convergence to e-mobility as well as the challenges faced and solutions that have been implemented in the Philippine context. All right, let me start with the challenges in urban transportation development. Like any other urban centers in, in the Philippines, um, where you know that the United Nations Environmental Program has actually for, uh, has actually estimated that more than 50% of our population are actually residing in urban centers. And the Philippines is not far behind. As you can see, um, as you can see on the map, you can actually see that in 1929, the Philippines had an urban population of about 29%, which then grew to about 45% in 2015. By 2050, it is projected that the urban population of the Philippines will reach 60%, thus increasing mobility demand in our urban centers. But what does that mean? That actually means that we can no longer rely on private vehicles to serve mobility needs of people. What we need to have is an efficient public transportation as the backbone of urban mobility. Now let's look at the Philippine context. You know, the Philippines is, is in a way, um, in a good place for an urban mobility plan because as you can see, it has a high modal share of um, public transport, right? So it, it does have a lot, of, a lot of people use public transport. It can range, depending on the city, can range between about 50% to 70%. And please note also that in this, in this particular um, data, you would have number of this is public mode and you'd also have walking which is when we talk about um, low carbon transport systems we need to also talk about talk about active transport we cannot just rely on vehicles we've been talking about vehicles earlier but more than that because since transport is moving people we actually need to actually actually look at how else can people move so active transport is also a component when we talk about the Philippine urban, uh, well, the urban mobility plan. There are other inefficiencies that are inherent in the Philippine system, one of which is the bo sporadic boarding and alighting. Um, and if you have been to the Philippines, you probably see uh, the jeepneys dropping off and um, picking up passengers anywhere they see, because the revenue is actually based on the number of passengers carried. Another challenge in the urban uh, in, in urban mobility in the Philippines is, of course, the contribution of the transport sector in GHG or greenhouse gas emissions. In 2016, GHG by sector, transport, as you can see, was the third largest contributor of greenhouse gas, next to agriculture and energy sector. And then of all the four sectors, uh, all, of all the transport sector, the road sector is by far the largest contributor, followed by the maritime sector, the rail sector, as well as the aviation sector. Therefore, it was timely that we actually started looking at the Philippine Urban Mobility Program. Let me just um, say that this is not probably the first foray of the Philippines in moving towards environmentally sustainable transport. Because back in 2009, the Department of Transportation and Communications did come up with a um, national ESC strategy. Unfortunately, because of the change of administration, this fell through the cracks. That's why the PUB, uh, the PU, the POMP, or the Philippine Urban Mobility Program, What's a timely intervention? Now, the Philippine, the POM is, um, has a vision towards, and I think Dr. La said this earlier, that it has a vision towards people first cities, empowered by efficient, dignified, and sustainable mobility. You know, dignified is very important when you talk about access to transport. This means that people of different abilities can actually take public transportation in an orderly manner. So dignity of travel is an important component when you talk about your urban mobility plan. It is also supported by the social, environment, and economic objectives and indicators. It's never just one. It's always this tripartite of, of, of factors that you have to look at. 
The POM actually propo also proposes a strategic action-oriented framework for sustainable urban mobility. It also supports and operationalizes the national transport policy. The national transport policy is a main policy in the Philippines that supports and guides transportation de system development, and it was enacted back in 2017, 2018. All right, let's walk through how we actually came, how we uh, developed our form. It started as far back as 2017. We started with um, awareness raising because it's very important for people to understand what it is all about, right? It started with awareness setting, and then we moved to partnerships with government agencies, including understanding the policies that are already in place to determine what other policies should actually be, um, uh, should actually be put together. And then once you know the institutional framework, so to speak, then we start moving towards data collection. So the third step in 2017 was actually uh, a, the, the in, con conduct of the inventory and status quo of the, uh, of the emission from the transport sector. And then in 2018, we then moved to consultations with key stakeholders, both from the national and the local government. Uh, I, um, so th these are consultations that have been done. Right, and then we also had um, study tours, study trips for policymakers. What is that for? It's actually to enable policymakers to imbibe the full extent of the transfer, the transformation that the POM actually embodies. And then, after we have had consultations, then we move to the integration of the Philippine. Um, urban mobility plan in the Philippine transport context. One very important uh, story I'd like to share is that during the interagency technical committee on transport planning, it was actually, um, it was actually suggested that instead of using NUM, okay, the National Urban Mobility Program, we use POMP to show the vigor of the plan. All right, so that's precisely why it became POMP. Okay. Earlier on also, there was a lot of talk about stakeholders that have to be uh, included in the entire process of coming up with a comprehensive urban mobility plan, right? Because as I said earlier, it's Maya Nihan, it's a whole of community approach. So I'd like to just share that this is the um, transport sector roadmap, uh, stakeholder map. So you have, of course, the Department of Transportation. The Department of Energy, because we do work with a lot with them uh, because of fuel and other energy needs. The National Economic and Development Authority is the um, supervising, so to speak. It's the overall policy making agency. So it, it looks at whether all the, all the plans of the different agencies are actually coordinated, right? And then under this, we have the Department of Transportation, GHG inventory team. Um, uh, by the way, in the, in the department now, we even have a nationally determined contribution, an NDC team as well. So we would have people to focus on this particular uh, issue. Of course, we'll have technical support. This is also earlier emphasized. The need to actually work with academe, uh, of course, the National Center for Transport Studies of which, uh, with which I'm a, a still a, a research fellow, and national government, uh, non-government organizations and civil service organizations. I'll have a breakdown of these in the next slide. This is just the general lay of the land. And these are the people, these are the groups who were actually included in the process. As you can see, it's color coded. You've got government. Of course, the pink one is those that are under the Department of Transportation. We also talked to the public, okay? Uh, so the public here would be the road users, right? So the pedestrians, the freight drivers, the public transport users, the cyclists, right? We needed to include them in the discussion so that we would understand their perspective on how urban mobility should be. And then we also talked to the private sector. These are usually the, the 
transport service providers, right? So the public transport operators, so vehicle manufacturers, the real estate developers, because later on I'll discuss a bit about transport or yeah, transit oriented development, as well as the delivery services. With such a comprehensive um, stakeholder consultation, this is now the final form of the buy-in um, Now, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but I'd rather just focus on an important component of it, which looks at non-motorized transport and public transport. Uh, by the way, I know that everybody knows that non-motorized transport is, has now been relabeled to active transport to emphasize the importance or the benefit of actually adopting that particular mode of transport. All right, so what has happened therefore? Based on that, we the pandemic has actually been, although it's been very tragic for the most part, but it has also given the department or the community that chance to look at active transport as a viable option for mobility of people. So because of the pandemic, the department strongly encourages cycling and other modes of non-motorized transport and personal mobility devices as an alternative travel mode that is to implement social distancing. All right, under the Bayanihan II, that means that the Senate, the Philippine government through the Senate has actually provided the uh, department with funds to build around 522 kilometers of bikeways in three key cities. And I think we are now at 80% in terms of, um, of completion. Aside from the active transport or the bikeways, I'd like to also share with you the nationally determined contributions, unconditional intervention that the department submitted to the Climate Change Commission in 2019, right? So if, if you look at this, the objective of course is to reduce greenhouse gas from the transport sector through transport fleet modernization, modal shift and infrastructure. If you remember earlier on, I said of all the four sectors of, of the transport, it's actually road that is the highest contributor. So if you notice also the national determined contribution that we submitted are most the road base, you know? So we've got mass rapid transit, public utility vehicle modernization program. Of course, you also submitted the railway projects and the motor vehicle inspection system. At this point, I'd like to just say that when we submitted it, we did not submit it solely. Uh, well, when we, when we crafted the intervention, it had always been the environment protection, environmental protection as a co-benefit but it's always about improving people's commute, improving travel of people in the urban area. Let me just give you a little bit, um, just a little bit of discussion on the PUV modernization program. The Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program is actually um, one of its main objectives because it has 10 components. It's actually to improve uh, the the jeepney, and so if you've been to the Philippines, you've seen our jeepneys, these are iconic, but they're also very heavy, pollute, uh, heavy pollutants. And so the, the fleet modernization is to upgrade our traditional jeepneys, uh, which do not have CCTV, GPS, dashboard cameras, and they are not PW or elderly friendly, and we use manual payment to a more modern jeep, to modernize jeepneys, with side doors. Now, if you've seen our jeepneys, uh, you would board at the back and this has been proven to be very dangerous. And it has CCTV, GPS, as well as dashboard camera. And because we are really implementing that they can board and alight on you know, the right stations, then it becomes PW as well as persons with disabilities and elderly friendly. All right, moving forward, um, Moving forward, if you notice, of course, that was just the first step of our NDC. But looking at the NDC expansion of the PUV MP, you would see that it's still anchored on fuel efficiency. However, the reduction of GHG can actually be 
more maxim can be maximized through the convergence to e-mobility. Where are we in terms of e-mobility? In 2019, this would be the stock based on the land transport office data. As you can see, we have a lot of electric uh, tricycles, the three wheelers, and e-motorcycles, the two wheelers, but very few in public transportation. The critical factors for increasing convergence to e-mobility in the Philippines would have to be the in electric vehicle uptake in the public utility vehicle modernization program and integration in the in, of green route in the local tra public transportation route plans. What is a green route? A green route is like, a, it's kind of like a, a route that vehicles, electric vehicles and uh, that are environment friendly can have use of that route. It makes them faster. They have, um, they have uh, priority over that. Another one is the implementation of a bill that uh, of a law where of, of the electric vehicle law, which among others, this is very important, legislates that the, the development of a comprehensive roadmap on electric vehicles. There is also a need for an increased participation and investment of the private sector. I'd like I'd like to just share with you what have been the challenges. The challenges, of course, have been to the public utility vehicle program is that the drivers refuse to actually change their old jeepneys to new jeepneys, to the modern jeepneys, precisely because they found it very expensive. So the solution has been to increase vehicle subsidy actually from 60,000 pesos to 120,000 pesos, as well as the formation of cooperatives. The lack of policy to support transition to electric vehicle, as I've mentioned earlier, I'm not going to repeat it, is really for the implementation of the electric vehicle legislation that has recently been passed. Another challenge, though, is the lack of data to simulate decarbonization scenarios. And so therefore, we're now looking at um, updating the GHG inventory. I forgot to mention that one of the powerful uh, one of the advantages, or for me, it's also power of the public, well, the POM or the urban mobility plan is the fact that it includes indicators that you can actually, you can actually use to determine whether you have, uh, you have been successful in that particular aspect. Another challenge in, in the Philippines, particularly now in the pandemic, is because of the reduced um, the uh, passenger capacity, the drivers, the public transport drivers now refuse to run because it's no longer viable. So we have actually gone into service contracting where we contract the drivers to just run the service based on vehicle kilometers, regardless of whether we have passengers or no passengers. This is a, this is now the um the difference in the previous previous system where you get paid based on the number of passengers. I'd like to end my sharing by looking at one of the components, and I can't go back, I'm sorry, it's too far back, but one of the components of the Philippine Urban Mobility, Urban Mobility Program is actually the inclusion of a transit-oriented development. But because in creating low-carbon communities, it is imperative that the land use and transport interaction is looked into. Hence, in the 2017 to 2022 National Urban Development and Housing Framework, transit-oriented development was actually adopted as a principle where it was defined as a well-developed pedestrian and cycling facilities connected to transport terminals and high-density walkable districts within 10-minute walk circle around the transport station. Now, there are also a, a policy yeah, a policy is now being developed by the, well, now they're called the Department of District, of Urban Housing and Development, okay? And uh, the policy is now being developed to integrate this strategy in the comprehensive land use plan of local areas. That's about it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asik Sheila. It's, it's uh, good that you mentioned about the 
Uh, the efficient, dignified, and sustainable mobility and starting off with that, you know, indeed, I remember these were the adjectives that I recall really being raised in the various consultations that we had, whether we're talking about walking, cycling, access to public transport, whether that's um, the old types of jeepneys or electric mobility, it's important that that would be like efficient, dignified, and sustainable mobility. Um, and uh, as, as you, as we heard, so in a lot of cases, city, cities also use um, e-mobility planning as a way to re-communicate re um, their sustainable mobility plans and agenda. Because electric mobility, as we as we learned, um, requires gathering almost the same set of diverse set of stakeholders. You've shown in one of your slides earlier with the uh, circles that you, you know, we include also the public transport operators, the planning ministries, um, also the real estate uh, developers um, and other private sector operators um, to plan this ecosystem. So of course we continue to involve the, the likes of energy ministries. Uh, one also that one point you also raised was that uh, PUMP uh, also includes indicators and providing a framework for driving this. Um, and so there are, so in, the, in that way, uh, the different ministries are able to, to see where mobility is being moved towards. So, you know, even with a diverse set of, of stakeholders. So thank you so much, Asik Sheila, for sharing with us the Philippine experience on this one. Um, so now... Um... Can, I, can I just say, I'd like to just thank, I forgot to thank Patricia Mariana. She was the one who gave me the slides on the stakeholders. So thank you very much, Pat. Yes. Thank you also, Pat. Pat is also, I believe, in the, the session today uh, from GIZ. Um, yes, we have been working with them on like, driving the PUMP uh, forward no, in the Philippines. So thank you also, Pat, for that. Um, great. So um, we have one question before we go to the panel discussion, um, because I think the results coming out of this Slido question that Nash will, will um, flash on the screen will help us kickstart the panel discussion. Um, the Having heard the experts uh, having heard the experts today and all the presentations what do you see as the main challenge for promoting electric mobility in nepal um so for to answer this uh, maybe we request you to go to uh, slido.com on a different browser or on your phone and just enter the um the event code 699097 uh, basically, we would like to understand what you feel are the, what is the main challenge? Is it on the policies that are insufficient um, in that you have seen earlier? What are the gaps there um, that you would like to point out? You can also do that by the chat. Um, are there also inadequate uh, charging infrastructure? Is it that? Uh, third, uh, is it on the supply? Uh, not enough EVs in the market and high cost of EVs. Uh, is it on the lack of political will to prioritize EVs or generally the lack of awareness on the benefits of EVs? So we have four answers. So give us your thoughts on this one. Um, this will also drive the discussions in the panel later, uh, which uh, Bhushan will uh, moderate, uh, but it also would shape how we will approach the next a few days um, on the uh, in this training and of course in the Solutions Plus project in identifying the interventions. Okay, so we have a few answers. So a lot of uh, you are saying that generally uh, it's the lack of political will to prioritize and the supply. Um, while we're doing that, let me just <laughs> take this opportunity to um, translate a little bit of what was said. A very sure. important um, remarks have been made and by um, Oliver and Sheila on non-pensums and pumps. Um, so let's try to pump this together. Um Dhanibat Savana Pila Chain Edi Tapa Hadley you got no bach in a bunny slido dot com majanus, right? Tesma code six nine nine zero nine seven hannus, ra yo um hamrosano survey ma sabagi unola, nepal kulagi, bidutia parivan agadi bodonu kulagi, mukya tsunoti kihu. Lack of political will oki, itchasakti oki, supply. Um, Gadiyar ne market ma chahi na aatha dheri manga chan charging infrastructure charge charging station aur na pugiya hoki awareness ne kami hoki aatha demand ko kami hoki tesma um aatha niti aur khas chahi na tesko aadhar ma hami dosro yaamro antim sathram lai pani elli guide garsa tesile aile hamile um dekhi rasa hami sath sainti sanayya chhau 
ती मध्य तेरह जाना ले भरे अच्छा बाकी लेचे गाय चाहिए तेजी ले कृपया करने वाला ऐसे बीच में ये बंदा अगर ये ट्वीट हम लोग प्रस्तुति थी यो चाहिए पहला को प्रस्तुति हम लोग इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी अथवा विद्युत ये परिवहन संबंधित थी बनी अयले अमीले चाहिए ट्वीट आप प्रस्तुति चाहिए अली ते बंदा � ऑलिवर ले अलग ती अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर में ये इसको कुछ रखने वाले थे कि न मौत उपर न चावने रहा राष्ट्रीय सारी यातायात अथवा सारी परिवहन ले आगाडी बनाऊंगी अपने तेज संबंधी कार्यक्रम हो रहे कसरी करना सकीन चावने रखे थे बनी तेज को एक उटा उदाहरण चाहिए फिलिपींस बड़ा आ गोते फिलिपींस अर्बन कितने इसको विजन किए थे वो बंदा कह रही एफिशिएंट डिग्निफाइड डी सस्टेनेबल मोबिलिटी अतः नेपाली में बनुपर कह रही प्रभावकारी एफिशिएंट डिग्निफाइड मर्यादित डी सस्टेनेबल दिगो यू तीन टा कैरेक्टरिस्टिक बनुपर सब बन्ने धारणा के साथ वहाँ ले अथवा तेज विजन के साथ वहाँ ले आगरी बढ़ने बात हो रहती विभिन्न कार्यक्रम मरु आगाडी ले आचा जस्ते यामी कोई फिलिपिन्स में जानू बात चाहिए तो यहाँ तो भाई जिप्नी आरु देखने उनसे जोन हर तक हेरी आकर्षक चंन तरतीन वाले प्रदूषण पर नहीं धेरे गर्म गर्म चंन तेज़ ले तेज़ ले तेज़ ले आधुनिक आधुनिकरण करने कार्यक्रम के बारे में पकड़ी वहाँ ले � धन्यवाद थैंक यू कैप थैंक यू बुशान आई थिंक वी हैव फेयरली गुड अमाउंट ऑफ आंसर्स टू द स्लाइडो क्वेश्चंस टू ड्राइव द डिस्कशन सो फॉर द नेक्स्ट पार्ट वी वुड लाइक टू इनवाइट सेवरल स्टिंगिश गेस्ट टू प्लीज जॉइन अस फॉर द पैनल डिस्कशन बुशान विल बी मॉडरेटिंग दिस सेशन एंड वी आल्सो ट्र to, to digest this, the lessons that we learned today. Uh, perhaps some of the questions that have been raised in the chat can also be raised during this time. And for this session, I believe we have a slide to present uh, who the panelists are. Um, we will be joined by five panelists. Unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Joshi from Ministry of Forest and Environment would be unable to join us. Uh, however, we are joined uh, by Mr. Bas Net, uh, from the Kathmandu Metropolitan City, uh, also Mr. Ram Chandra from the Kathmandu Valley Public Transport Authority. We also have uh, Sanika, which is, uh, she's the co-founder of Alloy Technologies. And we also have with us from Sri Echo Visionary, uh, Umesh, who is the CEO, and, uh, and Shyam, from, uh, who's the Deputy Executive Director of uh, uh, the Province Transport Operation and Management Board of a Mopit in Bagmati province. So, uh, Bushan, I will give the floor to you and to the panelists that we would like to welcome for this uh, for this evening, yeah? Um, thank you, Kat. What I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take this conversation ahead um, in English and Nepali. Uh, partly it's gonna be in English, partly it's gonna be in Nepali because we just want to have a free flow of um, information. And I know that a lot of the participants are Nepali, but I know also realize that some of the participants are do not understand Nepali. So we'll have to give them time to learn Nepali but we don't have right now. So we will um, do a little bit of English and a little bit of Nepali. Um, so let me try to do that. And because we have very little time, we said that we'll start at around 4.15, but it's already 4.26. Um, but let me just straight, straight away go into this. Sabailai, swagat sa, mero yo panel ma. Aun bhaaka panelist haru, agi bhaniya chate. Ram Sadra Podel ji, हमरो यात्रा जो स्थान विभाग बढ़ाऊं बात सा सौरव बस्ती जी काठमांडू मानगर पाली का बढ़ाऊं बात सा सीएम सिंधर जी बागमती प्रदेश को यात्रा जो स्थान बोर्ड बढ़ाऊं बात सा उमेश जी प्राइवेट सेक्टर बढ़ाऊं बात सा श्री एको विजुअली में काम करने उनसे रसात साथ है लेकिन वेकल एसोसिएशन ऑफ नेपाल संबंध कसरी चाहिए ये लाय अगाड़ी बढ़ाऊंगे सकें इंसा र अगे को यो सानो हमने सर्वे जस्तो गरे आते हो उन एसपी सना ले सर्वे भरे आते हो तेज पे क्या देखी देखी इंसा बंदा केरी सब बंदा कौन कानी रहा आते हो बंदा केरी लैक ऑफ पॉलिसीज पॉलिसीज चाहिए खासी समस्या हुई ना अथवा सब मुख्य समस्या हुई ना खासी 
was that major challenge bhane ko ichha shakti athwa the um willingness to do something political um you know will bhano athwa you know there are people who are in power have to take that action to get that policy implementing and that was what we found lacking so our discussion is just going to follow that friends see how that goes before we do that i'd like to invite my panelists to shortly introduce themselves tell us who you are and what are you doing in this field but no more than please do not take more than 1 minute each suruma hai ta 1 minute bhitra ma tapai le ke gardai hununcha yo chhetra ma ko hununcha bhanera alikati ta hamle thapa hale tara pani ramchand sir tapai bade shuru garau ki good afternoon everybody namaste i am uh, ramchandra podel i am a technical director of department of transport management and i am with this uh, department of the ministry of physical infrastructure and transport since last uh, around 5 years and my total experience with government of nepal is around 15 years thank you ramchand ji tapai ko introduction ma tapai yo transport authority ko ma pani hununcha bhannu bhayo thyo gathan bhayo chha ra um so my um, side by side i am also working as uh, um the executive director of kathmandu valley public transport authority for the time being is that already formed i, I didn't realize it was formed it is good that it is if it is uh, excuse Ka me kathmandu valley transport authority is it already uh -huh. there i thought no, it was just kathmandu a... valley public transport authority is a infrastructure development committee actually so precursor okay. for the final authority is going to come after the once, once the act is bill is passed by the parliament the authority itself will come into existence right now is the authorities a development committee only acha acha yo act aai sakya chaina tesaile aile ko lagi yo pradhikaran ko development committee banaya cha jun tapai ko netrut ma cha dhanyabad um let us go to shyam sundar ji from federal government to provincial government hello everyone namaste i am sam sundar sapkota uh, i am the deputy executive director at province transport operation and management board um generally the organization my organization is focused on development of public transport electric public transport within uh, bagmati province so not only that we also uh, formulate and uh, rules and regulations for the ev uh, uh, in the bagmati province so we are constantly working uh, in the same sector uh since uh, seven eight months and the progress is happening thank you thank you sam sundar ji and just for people who don't who are from outside kathmandu let me just inform you that when we say bagmati province it's the province which includes kathmandu so in in many ways it, it's probably the most important um, province um, because it includes the capital city and it's also the most um, you know with the highest population and also the biggest economy and so on but for me it's most important province because it's the most aggressive province when it comes to pro promoting electric mobility it's the one province which has said that within 10 years we're going to have all um, electric mobility in our in our cities so um welcome sir let's now go to the municipal government kathmandu metropolitan city saroj bosnet is um, please introduce yourself sir Yeah, namaste everyone. Uh, my name is Saroj Basnet. Uh, I am currently working as vice chairman of, of Kathmandu Metropolitan City. Uh, we are currently, you know, uh, developing different, especially small infrastructure projects, you know, which, which that, that are being constructed by the municipality. And also, we are doing, you know, some some initiatives on the on the electric vehicles that we are planning to do. but uh, so far we have not you know achieved any any significant uh, achievement we have done uh, but however we are trying to you know uh, do our level best uh, to promote electric vehicles in kathmandu thank you um thank you saroj ji now let me go to the private sector i think um umesh ji you've been around for a long time um tell us what are you doing okay namaste everybody uh, my name is umesh raj shrestha uh uh a passionate uh, i would like to introduce myself as a passionate ev entrepreneur i've been in this uh, field from last uh, 23 24 years and uh, uh, i am also the past president of electric vehicle association of nepal and uh, right now also i am promoting ev and uh, bringing some electric vehicles uh, assembling new vehicles like that thank you very much Thank you. Yes, Umesh is very passionate. If you go to his workshop, you know there are always little things happening, some innovative things happening. When I showed you those 
um, in my slide presentation, those converted vehicles, um, some of was him, some of it was his doing. And um, if you see those small little toy cars in Kathmandu these days, that's all he's doing. He brought some small vehicles for the small dudes of Kathmandu. Um, last but not the least, let's go to Sonika. Uh, thank you, Bhushanji, and namaste, everyone. I'm Sonika, fintech founder. Uh, I'm today representing Alloy, which is a fintech platform which helps uh, women entrepreneurs, especially in Sapa Tempo or the electric vehicle sector in Nepal, to access uh, easy and affordable financing. Um, and we are basically helping them grow trust between the financial institutions or the funders um, by using digital tokens so that they can prove whatever they are um, uh, taking as a loan or a fund is actually going in the EV sector. So we are ensuring uh, uh, that our software is tracking the fund and impact uh, that goes into EV sector in Nepal. Thank you. Um, thank you. Don't run away, Sonika Ji. I'll, I'll start the question round with you itself um, because I think you're doing probably the most um, different and innovative things among the lot. Just like this one minute introduction, you put in so many in there. You packed it like one, you're a fintech company. Tell me what a fintech company is. Um, second, you're working with women entrepreneurs and EV to ease access of funds. Yeah? So how is that happening? And you're doing it through digital tokens. What the heck is that? You know, what are you doing? And most importantly, how can all these people in the panel, the, the central government, the federal government, the uh, municipal government, um, and other colleagues, you know, such as Umeshji and his Electric Vehicle Association of Nepal, how can they work with you? How can they make things happen for you? So tell us a little bit about that. Thank you very much. Five questions. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll give you three minutes for that. Or, yeah, or... yeah, yeah. Please, please stop me anytime if I go, uh, if I exceed. Uh, uh, so fintech, uh, first, the uh, very, very lemon um, description of fintech is um, mixing finance, uh, Bithya, and then the technology uh, together to, to create something innovative. Um, I guess uh, right now when we talk about fintech or any, any kind of financial technological uh, solutions, it's, it's usually... Uh, usually targeted at uh, very sophisticated users or urban setting users, right? But what we are trying to do is uh, how to ensure that the people or the users at the very grassroots level, for example, the informal sector drivers and owners of electric vehicle sector have also access to these sophisticated technologies such as FinTech or digital tokens. Um, so uh, second question was how are we ensuring the easy access to financial, uh, uh, easy access to finance, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'd like to always talk with the stories. So one of the stories I'd love, love to share is uh, we are working with, for example, um, uh, Devi Ji from, from Safa Tempo sector and she is uh, now struggling, uh, this sector that started in 1995, now she is uh, struggling to upgrade her vehicle battery. So we're not talking about bringing, you know, uh, new, new or EVs in the in the sector, right? Uh, the, the existing EV sector is struggling because these women who have been in this industry for the past uh, you know few decades uh, are struggling to upgrade their technology just because uh, the formal sector, the formal financial institutions cannot trust them with the investment. Um, and I, I was uh, talking with uh, one of the financial institution two days ago and uh, I came to know that the central bank uh, have given uh, given the directives that the finance finances can give out up to 12 lakh to 15 lakh without collateral to women entrepreneurs. But they were hesitant to give that. And I asked why, 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 why are you only giving three lakhs instead of 15 lakh? Otherwise 15 lakh would, you know, uh, bring them multi-mine battery very easily, right? But they are not trusted. Um, uh, and one of the problems that finances mentioned that, uh, was they cannot trust because as soon as the loan goes out, it, it is in cash and then they, they cannot really track. It's all manual intervention, How uh, it, whether or not the loans are actually being used in the business, whether or not they are going to be repaid and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so what we promised to the financial institution uh, was uh, we'll give them the digital token platform that Alloy, my company have built, which will ensure that as soon as the money goes out of your accounting system, for example, their core banking system, right? We'll track which vendors is the, uh, are these uh, loans being used at, which means we are basically telling them that the uh, loan which are being dispersed for electric vehicle is actually being used for the intended purpose and the business purpose so that the money or the repayment or the EMI will come back to their home um, easily and so that uh, it 
it really ensures that the person who is taking the loan, which in our case is a women entrepreneur in Sapa Tempo industry, are trustable and they will be uh, repaying the loan. So that's how we are we are helping them uh, have easy access and and um, very happy to share a standard charter to also investing without collateral and without keeping the vehicle as collateral for the very first time. So that's very first thing that we are materializing with uh, one of the commercial bank in Nepal also. Uh, and happy to share more if you connect uh, to me or with LinkedIn, I'll I, I definitely uh, be sharing more than three minutes if you want to. Um, so what are these digital tokens, right? Um, definitely sounds very sophisticated. It, it definitely sounds like cryptocurrency, which we are not. <laughs> so let me tell you, we're not Bitcoin, we're not Ethereum or whatever, you know, because uh, these tokens that we are talking about is, is uh, made to, uh, you know, uh, used within the closed loop ecosystem. For example, the electric vehicle sector, right? Uh, it can, we, you cannot go to uh, the market and trade it for other, other kind of cryptocurrency. That's why it's not cryptocurrency. It's, it's a very, uh, very, very simple term is the digital fund management tool. So basically we are um, giving the financial institution or the funder the access to platform that tells, uh, uh, in which the money actually tells you where, where it is right now. Uh, whether it is with the bank or the borrower or the vendor, right? So you, you can really track the funding where, wherever it is going, even if it is one rupees, 10 rupees, tens of thousands of dollars or whatever kind of amount uh, you want to track. Um, and finally, I guess all the, all the, um, uh, all the dignitaries in, our, in, in my panel, in our panel, I guess uh, there are a lot of possibilities we can work uh, together. Uh, for example, with Umeshi, I, I've been in contact with Umeshi for the past two years, and I'm working with Sri Eco Visionary in, in giving access uh, to, um, you know, the women entrepreneur, uh, the battery. Uh, so he, he has been very, very knowledgeable expert in this industry and also uh, been a very very um, experienced vendor in the electric vehicle sector. So uh, with the government, definitely policy-wise, uh, you know, we work on the ground. Uh, we work with these entrepreneurs. If you uh, see if there, if there is any kind of, you know, learning session uh, you need from us or, or uh, we can learn both ways, right? So I don't have concrete steps on how we can work together right now, but definitely the policies and the traditional ways of financing needs to be changed so that the grassroots micro entrepreneurs have easy access to finance and then easy access to uh, growth of their, of their business and eventually that will uh, help prosper Nepal, I guess, as a whole. Thank you, Mushonji. Sonika, thank you, Sonika. I, I, I know you've crossed your three minute limit, but it was very useful. And um, um, you may not have concrete you know, suggestions for working together, but I think that the um, communication that has been started, I think that will, you know, we hope to, it ends up in a concrete um, suggestion. Let me move over to, over to Umesi. Um, Umesi, you, you've said you've been working in this sector for more than 20 years. For more than 20 years, we've seen Safa Tempo on the streets of Kathmandu. About 20 years ago, there was, you know, 500, 600 Safa Tempos. We went up to 700, but it stopped. For the past two decades, we've had 700 Safa Tempos. In fact, it has gone down because a few of them are not operating. What went wrong? We were doing so well. What went wrong and what should we do? Okay. Uh... <laughs> Basically, I am happy to be in this platform uh, as Shamzi uh, from the Bagmati province is there and uh, Ram Chandraji is also there. And uh, uh, here, actually, the history uh, of a Shafa temple, uh, it was very encouraging in the beginning because we were rep replacing the uh, fossil fuel Bikram temples with these Shafa temples. And uh, on the way, after after some time, uh, uh, in Instead of a Bikram Tempo, uh, the government uh, told that uh, the, the microbuses will enter and there was a Gans Tempo and uh, other microbuses was there, uh, which uh, made a hurdle in the beginning. And afterward, the, you know, right now, uh, the main, main problem uh, from last uh, one decade is there is uh, some restriction to uh, register the three wheelers of a Tempo. And... Uh, uh, as we can see in our prior uh, you know, presentations also in the Philippines or if you can see in India or in uh, any other country, uh, actually the three-wheeler vehicle are used as a last mile transport and it is one of the mode of a transport in the market mix uh, of a public transport. And these things has not been yet, you know, understood by the government itself where, uh, 
we need uh, you know uh, so, like we are we are talking about the tertiary roots and secondary roots and primary roots uh, so in this case uh, for a tertiary root still we have we are in need of sulfur tempos and uh, another thing is these sulfur tempos are manufactured in nepal uh, so it should be promoted i i i always say uh, I, I was uh, i always say that and you know uh, even for a taxis even for a taxi small autos yeah, also should be an electric uh, so there is a lots of a possibility for a la last mile transport of a three wheeler but uh, there has been always always a, a policy problem and uh, hurdles in you know getting a route uh, like that yes okay thank you um yes up to you Thank you. I, I I think my internet connection briefly went out in the middle, so I lost some of you at what he said. But basically, um, the challenges that you faced is one um, initially competition coming from gas tempos, gas, well gas tempos, but gas uh, microbuses and and then you know other microbuses, and also these were subsidized in the initial stages, um, and therefore um, you know these went ahead. But later, then it was restrictions in in registration of new sulfur tempos and also i think you know even technology wise we have not um you know changed much in the past 25 years or so but still um these sulfur tempos for the a lot of them are still operating and so on um, and doing well doing providing very valuable service let me now go to the you know municipality Saroji. okay um how do you see a big municipality like Kathmandu working with you know sulfur tempo entrepreneurs like umesji or sonikaji or other um, public sector providers to you know promote electric vehicles. So, what are some of your ideas on what municipalities can do, or what um, the central government and you know provincial government can do to work with municipalities in the sector? Uh, thank you, Bhusanji. Uh, yeah, uh, as you said, you know, Kathmandu municipality. Uh, it's, it's a big municipality. Yes, it's population wise, it's big, you know, uh, and it's also, you know, the density wise also, it's very, you know, the, the Kathmandu is having the high, highest density in among all the municipalities. Uh, but uh, the the problem with the municipality or in Kathmandu Valley is it is uh, there are there are so many other municipalities all adjoined together. You know, there are 18 different municipalities. So our main problem is to how to coordinate among the municipalities is the major challenge here. You know, it's not only the Kathmandu municipality doing something, you know, it has to be a kind of, you know, uh, integrated or coordinator approach we should follow. That uh, the, the, which the, you know, uh, the, the the concept of you know integrating having a, an integrated approach by the formation of the Kathmandu Valley Transport Management Act in which it was proposed to lead uh, the authority by the mayor of Kathmandu but it's not it's it's, it's still no, uh, has not uh, come into uh, the practice you know so uh, that is one part and the other one is uh, the municipalities could start a small initiatives you know small initiatives like giving uh, some kind of tax rebate or exemptions on uh, on the business tax that we have started giving the business tax uh, exemption from this year's who uh, the, for the you know uh, the, the business tax for the uh, um, workshops or charging stations or or you know selling the business you know retail business if any electrical one electrical vehicles you know they uh, do the business of electric vehicles then there is a uh, exemption on the business tax and other could be the municipalities could also you know give uh, some kind of uh, uh, rebate or exemption on the parking lot you know parking space where if the electric there's an electric vehicle, then the parking uh, space could be, you know, giving some rebate. Mm -hmm. Coming down to, you know, working with the, you know, private entrepreneurs like Sonikaji, Umesi, and other entrepreneurs, uh, I, you know, feel that the municipalities could be a kind of, you know, uh, a, a, a facilitator, you know, uh, in the in the in their program and also their municipalities could launch the programs like the uh, innovation programs you know 
that we did uh, some a few years ago uh, that the that that entrepreneurship or you know our sheet money could be you know uh, given to them you know or provided to them you know or the small entrepreneurs you know so these kind of initiatives uh, probably you know municipalities could uh, do um, yeah thank thank you saraji i i um, i i'm I'm, I'm quite happy with the innovative programs that KMC has done, particularly the City Planning Commission under your leadership, um, mm -hmm. supporting startups, um, yeah. young people, you know, doing innovative work um, like Sonika Ji and Umesh Ji is also fairly young, I guess. Um, he looks young. Now, let me move on to um, the provincial government. Um, Shyam Sundar Ji, you've, like I said, I think the Bagmati provincial government has been very um, forthcoming in promoting electric vehicles. Um, you come up with your... Um, bold target um you've also started you know you, you put up tenders to, to to purchase electric vehicles and um, also put up charging stations and so on what is driving this is it political will is it um something else and what are you doing you know in in, in your in the days ahead uh thank you busanji uh, first of all uh, you asked me uh, what, uh, what is driving force so basically, I will say in uh, first and foremost, uh, the thing our uh, chief minister, he had imagined about uh, the province, the Dormani Podem, uh, who is a very much uh, environment friendly person. And he has done a lot of uh, uh, greenery thing in Hitonda and even uh, in many places when he was a mayor here. So uh, first and foremost thing is his vision to uh, accommodate electric vehicle within the province. So um, major driving thing about the electric vehicle in province government in uh, Bagmati province is his vision. I would say, I, I will have to say, I will have to accept that. So uh, later on, all the other uh, stakeholders also accepted and even the old is going towards the EVs and everyone is uh, following that. And uh, we could not be uh, alone uh, without having EV, all those things. So uh, his willpower uh, is, and his uh, mission to do something, his uh, mission to do something in EV and to keep city clean and even the province clean. That is the most important thing and uh, which is driving uh, the, 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 these things. So another thing is like, uh, because of his will, I, uh, he had uh, in fiscal year uh, 2076 and 77, 28 crore of budget was allocated for only for the uh, EV. In 2077 and 78, 40 crore budget was allocated for EV. And in uh, 2077 and 70, uh, 78 and 79, 50 crore budget has been allocated only to purchase uh, electric buses uh, for the ba uh, Bagmati province. And uh, those budget which were allocated in the previous two years, it was not, uh, it was not used uh, to do anything because the, there, was, uh, the, 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 there was no any proper uh, governmental body to uh, use that uh, allocated fund. So in 2077, uh, the province transport operation and management board was uh, formed and uh, where I'm uh, working, currently working. So from that organization, uh, we have started the work and uh, we had done uh, last year itself, we had done tenders uh, for 30 electric buses and the 15 a vehicle charger, but unfortunately, only two uh, bidders uh, participated in the bid, and the, even the bid was uh, above our budget. So we uh, were uh, we had to cancel the bid, and even uh, and now we are planning uh, within two three days we are going uh, for the rebid uh, for the same. So. Uh, this is one of the uh, things we are doing in Bagmati province. Like uh, I said earlier, 50 crore has been allocated this uh, uh, for this uh, year. And uh, that is only for the bus. And we are planning to have one refresh center uh, in Bagmati province this year. And 
at least four charging stations um, uh, and the parking depot and budget for the same has been allocated for this year. So, and another uh, important thing is everyone is positive, even today, before this meeting, I was with uh, Chief Minister, uh, uh, current Chief, uh, Chief Minister, and she has already given us the permission to go ahead with the uh, purchase of the buses, I mean the tender. So everyone is very much a positive uh, regarding the uh, electric uh, vehicles and electric buses. Uh, in this province. And one of the reasons why the organization is driving towards the positive change, our organization is driving towards the positive change is, I have worked with the EV industry since last uh, 12 years, automobile industry. And I know uh, what needs to, uh, needs to be promoted and what needs to be, I mean, uh, promoted in the EV sector, why EV needs to be uh, promoted. So uh, I can, uh, deliver my, I mean, uh, I can address the problems of even the uh, private sectors, uh, private EV importers, not only the manufacturers, all, all those things, even I can convince the uh, government. So because of that, we are trying uh, to uh, uh, promote uh, EV in this province. So another important news I will share with you, even, uh, even though the, there is a conflict between the uh, transport authority uh, department and uh, uh, province government, but we are trying to uh, regulate the transportation thing from the uh, province ministry. So uh, from this year, I mean, we are planning for the 100, uh, planning to open 100 uh, electric taxis this year. And even those uh, which uh, after 20 years, as you know, that uh, those uh, taxes which uh, needs to be scrapped, we're trying to give some subsidy or some facilities uh, if they want to convert, uh, con uh, do conversion after 20 years, we will do uh, something, uh, some um, uh, subsidies will be given. So these, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, things which we are uh, uh, doing in our uh, provincial level. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Samson. It's great to hear all these initiatives. And, and especially, I know you're coming from the private sector um, that was already in, in, in the EV business for quite a while. You are well aware of some of the challenges, um, you know, that facing the private sector. And, you know, you know, as they say, where the shoe pinches, um, you were aware of that. And it's good to have you in um, a position of power to actually make a difference. Let me come to Ramzan Nasar now. Ramzan, you've heard, you know, from these, A, the private sector, who, you know, Sonikaji trying to do some work, innovative work with um, women who are involved in the EV industry. Uh, Kumeshi has been involved in this for quite a while, and but he, um, he was saying how restriction in registration of Sabha Tempo has been um, a bottleneck. Sonikaji is saying coordination is a challenge. Um, and Shamsundaji also saying, you know, they still need to more, more coordination between the central and level, you know, provincial level. Um, and we see that, and I know because of the con when the new constitution came also there has been some changes in the institutional structure how are you taking all of this and how are you moving ahead with this especially now that you are also an executive director of the Kathmandu valley transport authority how are you going to engage uh, people like saroji and Kathmandu Mahanagar palika or um you know the Pro bagmati province or um you know the private sector and take this forward what are some of your plans that I'm so having listened to this all this uh, conversations uh, those before so we can uh, see that finance coordination, new federal structure and how EV electric mobility can be pro promoted or we can say environment friendly mobility can be promoted. So in that case, uh, right now I'm representing two organizations, so Department of Transport Management as the federal regulatory authority, also policy recommending authority and Harmony Valley Public Transport Authority Development Committee. So that development committee or the authority itself is just concerned about the management of the public transport within these three districts of the Kathmandu Valley. So uh, let me talk about the uh, department first, so about the federal policies and programs which may come in the future. So may, major hurdle with which, which we can uh, realize is that uh, electric uh, vehicles technology is a good technology. Okay, it's fine, but it's increasing also. It's usually increasing in the country. You can see that, but. Uh, 
first thing which people feel is that the cost reduction, the financial resources thing is that. So maybe we need to further um, uh, decrease the custom duty. Already it's a significant sub uh, this exemption is there, no problem. But for purchasing uh, electric vehicle and operating into it into a public transport service, I think we need to provide uh, more uh, uh, facilities like um, uh, soft loans, uh, easy loans through our banking institutions. I think the monetary policy or the budget I can address that, that can be done in the coming year. We can also provide cash subsidy and procurement like the FAME policy in India, that is another thing. And uh, also we need to reduce the custom duties on the spare parts and batteries that are used extensively in the electric vehicles. That thing is necessary. Another important thing is that uh, charging stations and charging infrastructure need to be built up throughout the country. And the federal government can work in that also in coordination with the provincial government and the local bodies. And the aspect is that, and uh, regarding this promotion of electric vehicles, it's a, it's a new technology, it's a kind of uh, technology incubation from the side of the government. That means we can provide all assistance, help, all subsidies, financial resources for a certain period of time, but it's market finally. If the technology cannot compete in the market, if it cannot uh, sustain uh, permanently, then that will be a different thing. So better other technologies may come in future like hydrogen fuel uh, technology, fuel, uh, maybe next promising technology is the hydrogen fuel. So maybe the fossil fuel vehicles will be phased out in a due course of time, but we have a very ambitious policy of uh, replacing all small vehicles within 10 years. That is another thing. But actually, if we try to, I think we should, uh, we should not um, enforce some technology in the market. We should uh, promote it, encourage it, stimulate it so that it can survive very economically and vi in a viable way in the market. That's why regarding the policies, they are probably uh, introducing power for this, uh, electric vehicles in public transport. I think the business should be done in a more um, profitable way, sustainable way from the viewpoint of uh, economic also. I think because uh, from our past experiences, we can see that the government bodies or the public institutions, uh, they have not been able to operate the, this business things very properly. So I think whenever the federal government or provincial government or even a local body uh, tries to procure some vehicles and operate it, we have to be careful about that thing. That means that thing has to be done in a very professional way, in a business-like manner. It has to earn profit. It has to be sustainable. Otherwise, procurement will not be a big business. That is a very easy part. We can procure, procure any number of bus, 50, 100, 200 buses we can procure. I think you have to be very serious about the sustainable operation management of this um, procured public transport vehicles, electric vehicles especially. And also we can provide some kind of uh, recognition for the EVs. That means we are going to embossed number plates. Maybe we have to use some green stickers or something like that. And we have to allow them to some restricted areas, heritage site also. That means people will be encouraged to use uh, electric vehicles. Maybe we can pro allow them into the core areas of the cities and prevent other fossil fuel vehicles. And regarding also this use of three wheelers, that is also a recognized thing that uh, in the tertiary routes of Kathmandu Valley, and also we have to use, I think, uh, this electric three wheelers, at least if, if uh, not uh, the petrol uh, three wheelers, we can use electric three wheelers in the tertiary routes to promote uh, um, this uh, mobility thing in the uh, suburban areas and the difficult areas in the Kathmandu Valley. I think these are the main thing and the regarding this uh, Kathmandu Valley Public Transport Authority. Uh, it will also recommend standards for uh, public vehicles to be used within the Kathmandu Valley. And also there's promoting cashless uh, fare payment system and um, um, the say public route management system, information systems will be there. That means if this valley, uh, uh, this transport authority works properly, it will develop a very integrated uh, information technology based and reliable public transport system in the valley that will reduce the use of a private mode of transport. I think that also promote to this more environment friendly uh, public transport. I think these are the things so which I have to say from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Ranjanji. That is very positive and very good, in, good to hear that A, you're considering additional financial incentives, um, custom duty exemption for um, spare parts and so on. I would like to um, you know, underline the fact that probably that financial incentives is more required for the public transport sector. Uh, me being from Sajayata, we just um, procured buses and we, we have to pay almost $100,000 for a diesel bus, sorry, an electric bus compared to you know, thirty thousand dollars for a diesel bus. So the the price difference is still three times higher. So I think in the public transport sector, I think that is required. In the private vehicle sector, I think it's almost price parity is there for um, other you know the cars and the, and the motorcycles. Probably the two wheelers side. The second thing you talked about, you know, 
coordination. And here I'd like to, you know, come back to how this can be done. And 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 I know you're in a very, you know, good position to do it because you're both DOTM and Kathmandu Valley, you know, Transport Authority. And I over there, Shamsundar Ji sits in the Bagmati Transport um, Management Board, almost like the Transport Authority. And we know that Kathmandu Valley is the biggest um, population center within Bagmati. So if Bagmati, you know, Transport Board wants to do anything significant, um, you know, it has to work with you. And then here we have Saroji saying that, you know, under the you know, leadership of mayor, um, these 18 municipalities can come together. So how can we cut, bring at least the three of you together into the, you know, a same um, boat and say that, you, how can you do it? And for EV, can we have some kind of EV task force or something? Because I know Delhi EV policy 2020 clearly says that Delhi would have an EV um, task force. Okay, we talked, we heard from Kochi the other day, just, I'm sorry, the, you know, just a few hours ago, and also Kerala state and government has it. So some kind of steering committee, coordination committee, um, what do you think to bring all these, you know, major stakeholders together to move forward? Or anybody, it's just, you know, little things that are happening in Hetaura, things happening in Kathmandu and things happening in, you know, of course, you're also based in Kathmandu, but isolated. How do we bring together? Ramchandji. Uh... Okay, that, that is the scenario actually. After this uh, promulgation of this new constitution in 2015, uh, the subsequent elections, right now there are two uh, guiding documents is mainly. One is the constitution and other is the unbundling document. Other also there are uh, acts related to the this um, allocation of revenues between these three tiers of government. But there is a kind of confusion. This is not settling down even after four or five years, you see. Actually, the transport sector so jurisdiction is now divided into this federal, provincial, and local level. So many things, many important things also have gone to the local level, but they are not yet, yet exercised their authority or power. But see, um, regarding this technical aspects of safety, uh, regulation, comfort, and many things regarding transport sector, even the private vehicles and public vehicles, I think there should be a common umbrella framework or regulation inside the country. Even in India, we can see that there is Central Motor Vehicle Rule, CMBR, which applies uniformly throughout India. In any other country, in the matters of emission, in matters of safety, matters of performance, I think regarding EV also, this common things should be governed by a common law. But right now in the country, in Nepal, you can see that there's a competition. Like we are province, so we are not concerned with the federation. We will make our own standards. We will buy our own things. We will make our own set of rules. Now the local bodies they have not yet uh, started doing the this transport management but there's a type of situation of confusion i think misunderstanding between the federal government and the provincial government at least we can we just visited five or six states right now last month we can see that very clearly so amid this situation i think there is there needs to be some kind of coordination because it's a country single country so it's a federal government is there provincial governments and they should work together in a collaborative way so Regarding the national policies, broader standards, which are more important, which should apply uniformly throughout the country, the federal government should make them. And the other things like promotion of the technology, okay, okay, giving subsidies, giving soft loans, okay, um, giving extra facilities for the electric vehicles that can be done by the even provincial governments and also by this uh, public good management things that can be done by this uh, local government. So like, for example, you see, the uh, regulation of taxis See, that comes into the jurisdiction of uh, local bodies, municipalities, not even to the provincial government. Regulation of taxi, their rate fixation, route permit, all these things, according to the unbunding document passed by the cabinet of Nepal, that is the specific uh, exclusive jurisdiction of the local bodies. So within Kathmandu Valley, there are 21 municipal uh, and rural municipal uh, this, um, the municipalities within the Kathmandu Valley. So if 21 uh, you know, bodies, they will work in different 21 directions and how can we achieve a common goal. So there should be some, I think there needs to be some policy revision, some coordination is necessary. Otherwise, all efforts will be duplicated and they will uh, go into different directions and the resultant uh, will not be uh, so strong, I think. I think we all agree that there needs to be coordination. My question is, as the EPIC body for think, transport, uh, can you take the lead for that? So, so we are taking the federal government has taken the lead, for example, like setting up this Kathmandu Valley Public Transport Authority and within the Kathmandu Valley. So at least that can provide a forum for all the local bodies within the Kathmandu Valley 
under the leadership of uh, mayor of the the proposed structure is that the mayor of Kathmandu metropolitan city will be the uh, chairperson of this uh, authority. So I think that can be a platform for coordination between the 21 local bodies in Kathmandu. So there is the initiative. So side by side, we have this uh, provincial uh, transport uh, board, management board uh, form formulated by this province government. I think so we should, three governments should sit together at least so that type of framework has yet not developed <laughs> since last four years. It, it will take time, surely that will happen in the future. But this situation will not prevail forever. But, but forever, I, I don't understand why can't you sit together? If you call a meeting tomorrow, you know, Sam mm -hmm. Sutterji Aunus or your DG calls a meeting and Saroji Aunus or, or even mayor calls a meeting, I don't see why they will not come. You know, if they come, come all the way from Hetona, he'll fly there. But Mm -hmm. It just doesn't happen, you know, and, and we have seen this in, like you said, four years since the constitution, and it hasn't happened. Um, let me go to Shyam Sundarji. As the provincial government, and we know that if for transport, you know, provin the constitution has given a lot of responsibility to the provincial government, right? Um, Tapainta, you are the transport board deputy, you know, leader there, and of course you've got your own, you know, the, 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 how much do you come talk to the 18 municipalities of Kathmandu Valley? What do you want to do? Obviously, the, the lack of coordination is there. Like uh, Saroswar is here. We are constantly trying to get land for the charging station since last six months uh, in Kathmandu Valley. Uh, even we sat for a meeting with uh, Mayor, uh, but the concrete decision hasn't come yet. Why? Why? What's the problem? The problem is there is no other. The, actually, the, the coordination between the province government and central government and the uh, uh, provincial government is not there. We have not been able to, like, like you said, uh, that this is a very uh, important thing. Like maybe we need to, let's talk. Let's not talk about other things right now, other transportation facilities. Let's talk about the EVs, even uh, uh, only for EV, we can make a task force and we could coordinate all those uh, three governments. And uh, it's very, nece uh, very necessary because we even we are not able to get the charging station, one charging station uh, for, uh, for our buses in Kathmandu. So that, that shows that we are lacking the coordination. And we, uh, which is very important. We, we need that. Okay, I, I'm, I know. I realize I'm talking to the government staff a lot, and, and I'll come to Mesti and Sonika in just a while. But I just wanted to take this conversation ahead. Um, just for EV, I mean, even this document. I know that you can't see this, but this is basically the document prepared at, that I showed earlier. Is the National Action Plan for Electric Mobility clearly says that there will be a um, you know, unit, EV unit, whatever you call it, a task force, a coordination committee, a Parishad, Pradhikaran, whatever, yeah? And this is signed by the secretary of, you know, MOPIT. Um, so, but we still don't have it. And I know sometimes leadership can be taken at the municipal level, at, at the mayor's level as well. And the mayors do, you know, have a lot of power, particularly the mayor of Kathmandu, Dalitpur, and so on, the big cities. And I know Kathmandu, and I used to work in Kathmandu City, you know, and I know there's a lot of firefighting that happens in Kathmandu. There's a lot of issues that constantly come up, the garbage issues and so on. And sometimes electric vehicle may not be a priority. Shorodji, I mean, and I see this thing not moving ahead at all at the central level. I know, I think we all know where, what the problem is. How do we solve it? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, the first uh, thing, you know, as I said earlier, the coordination is the one issue. The other one is the the most important part of it is the the you know uh, just uh, you had this poll just before that. There's a second poll. It says that the political will is the you know is the is the most crucial factor uh, for the you know uh, for the promotion of the uh, this thing EV. So I also you know uh, have the same same opinion that. Uh, once you know the, the there is a political will strong political commitment then uh, the even the you know difficult things you know uh, become uh, easier you know so just just take an example of uh, this uh, solid waste management the solid waste management issue has been you know so much you know a kind of you know it has been uh, a, a prolonged 
uh, mismanaged issue, no, for so long time. Uh, but uh, you know, just you know, the the, the, the uh, mayor of Kathmandu. He says that now we are going to solve this problem. Now all the municipality mayor of the Kathmandu municipality they have come, they have come together, and they have, you know, reached uh, to some conclusion to manage it. So similarly, so this kind of transportation is transportation is why it is not getting the attention. Uh, so far I know is it's not the transport management is not solely the responsibility of the local municipality, you know, of the of the municipality. That is one part. That is why it is not under the priority of uh, the municipality. Though the 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 responsibility given to the municipality is to manage the footpaths you know that is the prime responsibility just to manage the footpaths you know just to uh, clear the encroachment in the footpath that is the most uh, the many municipalities the traffic police are doing uh, these days and also there is you know the the, the managing the taxis are uh, another you know is another responsibility so uh, so uh, so i think you know one is the political will uh, the other one is the, you know, uh, the, the coordination part. Uh, and uh, thirdly, uh, there should be a clear cut um, uh, mandate on the management of the transport system uh, for, uh, to, the, to the local uh, government. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the private sector participants now. But from one of you, one of three of you, I would like to have a commitment okay, to actually at least start this process. Even if it is a, just a meeting, um, to you know, EV for EV promotion, can we have a little you know meeting? Can we have a little task force? Can we have a little um, you know fun? You know, just coordination. Um, I know Shyam Sundarji talked about hundred taxis, e taxis. Um, Ramchandji just said, well, that is a local issue. Sarojji also said, you know, it, it's a you know there you know and municipalities want to do it. You know, as a Kathmandu resi Valley resident, I don't care who does it. I'd love to see electric taxis. I know that there are two. And as the private sector, Umesi, what do you want to see? How you know? What do you want to see from the the government authorities? You know, how do you get coordination? And for you, which level of government would be the easiest to work with? See. Uh... <laughs> I know that's a difficult question, but. Okay. Uh, can you hear me right now? Yeah, well, I can hear you, yes. Some disturbances is there, I think. I Hello? can hear you. Hello. Sunsa, who is it? Sunsa? Sunsa. Okay. Uh, basically, if we go into some uh, past experience, in 2006, I did a conversion of uh, electric uh, fossil fuel vehicle to electric. Okay. And it was very difficult to register. And in 2014, uh, when the environment-friendly transport policy came, there was there is a policy for a conversion at that time. But for the implementation process, we had to wait for a long time. And even there is a budget um, uh, in a gadget also. Uh, it is already um, came. And uh, even Sam Sundarji just told that the, there could be an incentive for our taxes if we, it, we, it will be converted in the future. But where is the implementation process at first? You know, uh, what is the standardization that government has proceeded for a conversion? That thing is, you know, very, very, very crucial. That, and uh, uh, now is it open for a registration of a conversion of a vehicle? We are still in a dilemma, okay? These are the things that, you know, policy, yes, of course, the, there is a, like, uh, in a public pool, it is already said that, you know, uh, there is a lots of a policy. Policy was uh, in the, I think, fifth rank, but political will was in the first rank. That is required, you know. So, uh, there is a policy already, uh, everything is there in the policy. Our policy is such a beautiful policy for a promotion of EV that I think, uh, uh, mo most of the a Asian countries can't match our policy. Uh, our policy is such a good policy, but implementation, it could be a last one. So, you know, there should be, a, you know, the uh, process where we can implement these policies nicely. You know, if we implement like, you know, 2014, uh, there was an environment transport policy. 
where it is i always say that the, these two documents about the the published in 2018 and 2014 these are the milestone document for the electric vehicle industry it is a, you know uh, is a very very good document where everything is written in a detail even it is like a project that has been given for a government but it it is not been implemented and okay. uh, uh, another thing i i i i want to enter in some uh, small thing like you have, you have been talking on uh, you know buses electric buses and uh, mass transportation in that that context also you know uh, basically the provincial government and uh, federal government mostly uh, 99% of uh, public transport is owned by the public uh, private sectors and what government is doing for promoting that those those sector uh, are we you know willing to convert all those public transport to uh, electric vehicle or not and uh, um, uh, only i have heard first time that uh, sam sundar ji said that the, if there is a, a pro, uh, probability for uh, converting uh, electric taxis uh, into uh, taxis into electric there could be some incentive and uh, like that only but for the electric buses if electric buses is threefold uh, expensive then how can uh, one individual can you know a private sector can uh, run the electric buses uh, don't we have to have some infrastructures or some policy some uh, grant facility some soft, soft loans like ramchandra ji said uh, we need some facility some infrastructure some strategy that could promote the public transport uh, into to uh, to convert into electric so you okay. know okay all right i'm going to try and stop you there because we're starting to run out of time uh, okay. not not starting to we already have run way out of time time and then i will come to you with a lot of important issues and i think um i've worked with ramson ji before and i know he has a lot of good ideas and he is he has tried in the past to implement them as well um, for example in the conversion part also i was just talking yesterday we were talking about how He's trying to you know come up with some standards for conversion and all that. I think it's all our duty to support that process. But then Ramsey also has to you know create an environment I think whereby entrepreneurs as well as provincials and local governments can support this process. I think what we want to do, you know, the direction we want to go is uniform. Um, there are a lot of forces that are pulling us apart, but I think we need to get together to do this. Um, I think what Ramsey talked about, you know. Additional support in terms of loans, soft loans, grants for public transport. What Umesh ji also talked about is the same thing, right? And and Shyam Sundar also talking about is the same thing. Conversion to electric. We need standards. We can't just let people convert, you know, theoretically. Um, but that I think we're working on. Finally, let me just go back to Sonika ji. You know, um, you bring in the gender perspective as well. You working with the you know women entrepreneurs, and one of the beauties of our electric public transport system is so many women engaged in this. Um, their livelihoods are dependent on this. What would you want? Once again, what would you think they would want from their government, whether that be municipal, federal, um, you know, provincial? I know you know the government interacts very little with the drivers, the you know entrepreneurs. So maybe this is your chance to get their voices heard Sanika. yes definitely uh bushan ji uh, and just echoing to what uh, umesh ji said and also bushan ji said right so uh, all the parties are available uh, i mean right here in the platform the government the technical expertise that umesh ji has and and you know the financial fund channeling expertise that uh, my company has i guess it's just needs to be um there's a common goal so just adding homa haste uh, of what pushan ji said so it's just um, the matter of starting with one meeting and bringing in all stakeholders and expertise to one table and definitely um, i i was very interested when uh, sham sundar ji talked about subsidy to to convert scrap taxis into evs right and and then ram chandra ji talked about cash subsidies and soft loan um, to to promote e mobility and definitely that uh, is something uh, that's lacking for the women entrepreneurs in electric vehicle they are not trusted for the finances for example they have um, given their 17 years 20 years of their productive years uh, to this electric vehicle and now 
um, you know, uh, in, in another eight years or 10 years, Safa Tempo will phase out uh, after its 30 year limit. Then what after that, right? No, uh, no financial institution or the formal form of, at least the formal financial institution will trust them for another 25 lakh or 34 lakh that they need. Or if they need, if they want to buy the bus, then it's, it goes beyond you know, 60 lakh or, or more than that. So uh, where will they get that kind of finances? So we need to um, really focus on building that financial vehicle for these women so that after Safa Tempo, it's, it should not be end of their business career. It should not be end of this beautiful women-owned uh, electric vehicle sector that Nepal had been proudly uh, talking about in all the conferences internationally, right, even now, but then it never grew from 700. It's it's even less now. So we, we should uh, definitely promote um, promote and build technologies and, and system that is uh, more than conventional, that is more than traditional, that, that really eases uh, the way uh, um, for women, uh, especially in the Safa Tempo industry, to to uh, to go towards uh, you know graduating from the informal sector to more formal and then to more uh, access to the kind of finance they deserve uh, for working in this climate friendly industry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, on the last thing I want to do, uh, and I know we have gone way over time, I want to give each one of you thirty seconds to make one commitment what you will do to promote the electric vehicle industry. From my side, I will start. I say as, Safa, as Saza Yatayat board member, we have 40 buses coming and tomorrow we're opening the bids for um, four more buses and hopefully that will also be positive and we will get the private sector. If at all possible, I'd like to see 44 women drivers driving these buses um, and we will work with Sanikaji to make it happen. So that's my commitment. Um, Umesi, what is your commitment for this sector? Please second, what do you want to do? My life is basically my life is committed to electric vehicles, so you know it is not. Uh, In addition <laughs> to what you've done already, so much I know you've done a lot. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, the my uh, basically uh, I'm lobbying in the market mix of the you know electric vehicle. You know, uh, basically I will be lobbying on that. Uh, okay. There is a requirement of uh, all type of electric vehicle, and basically in the public transport sector. All type of electric vehicles should be, you know, incorporated. An that integrated is, mix of, you know, pub, you know, public transport vehicles for, with EVs. You'd be doing something lobbying on that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, yeah, KMC, KMC actually, you know, wants to promote uh, this uh, hop on and hop off service. You know, uh, connecting di uh, different uh, this um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, tourist routes. You know. Uh, so maybe uh, with Saza or or any other, I think Saza would be the best to you know uh, co uh, co uh, to partner with. Uh, so maybe be, you know in 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 this year itself, we should initiate this half and an half of electric service. Thank you, from Saza. That I commit five buses for that out of the forty. And if you if you help, we'll have the next tourist season starting in February. Electric hop on and hop off service in Kathmandu Valley. Um, Shamji, I mean, key commitment, sir. Naya kura ke ya, dheri kura bani sir. Naya sir, you said a lot. I know. No, uh, uh, if Ramchandra sir, Saru sir, allow me, uh, I would like to be a, a, a member for coordination uh, within uh, for all those uh, three. Uh, governments, because that is the most important thing. Everyone is doing, everyone is talking, everyone is, I mean, promoting EV, but nothing is happening. So let's do it together. Let's let's sit so, together and let's have some conversation and then let's drive it forward. I, I would like to say that. So you being, you know, sitting in the middle, you should do it actually, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. government is sitting yeah. in the middle and there's always too much politics happening in Kathmandu Valley and you're sitting in the middle, yeah. so sometimes that's also beneficial, and I think Saroji just gave him, gave you his thumbs up for that. So you're having yeah, that. Thank you, sir. Um, now, finally, Ramchandji, um, Siamji is asking for your permission to start the coordination effort. Tapai ko jawab for tapai ko commitment is my case. Oh, all sorts of efforts will be welcome. Are very uh, urgent, urgently required. So, from our side, from the as a federal regulator, I think our our the main responsibility is regulation, but side by side, we also promote. So we want to do some very uh, visible thing that will facilitate this operation of EVs. So maybe as an example, we want to set up some 
charging station networks along the interstate, interprovince uh, national highways this year in coordination with uh, Nepal Electricity Authority and other stakeholders. Thank you. From um, our side. Thank you. We didn't invite the Nepal Electricity Authority for this panel because A, we already had a lot of members of the panel and B, the third day of this training is whole day you know, dedicated to charging um, infrastructure and we're going to have Nepal Electricity Authority. Sagarji is going to come and discuss their plans there and so I hope you join that as well. Thank you all of you for being um, exceptional members of this panel. We've been going for an hour. We promised 45 minutes but you've been here and thank you all my audience. Even, even after we've gone half an hour beyond the time, you've been here. Um, and I'm sure on behalf of Oliver, I can commit that um, Solutions Plus will provide any assistance required to, to the limit of the um, resources available um, to make this happen. And so tomorrow I expect Siamji to send an email out calling for coordination to all the relevant stakeholders. Um, so once I, I, I get that email, if, I, if I'm invited, and then I commit myself to participate in that process as well. Thank you very much. That's the, that's the end of our training for today. We have three more exciting days coming up. Um, tomorrow, we'll be going into the technology aspects of electric vehicles. So we're going to talk about operations, the maintenance, the retrofitting of electric vehicles, conversion. When, um, um, so, you know, tomorrow is a little bit more technical, but, you know, I think you'll enjoy it even for people who are not very technical in nature. On day after tomorrow, we're gonna to look at the charging infrastructure. Again, that's a very important um, element of the EV ecosystem as a whole. Um, and then um, the best part probably is the day day after tomorrow is we're gonna go for a field visit. What can, what can an um, EV training be without actually looking at an EV, the touching an EV, um, feeling it. Um, so some of you may not even have you know, felt it. I mean, you may have seen it, but you know, open it up see what is inside, what actually makes that EV run. Um, we'll go, to, we'll visit Digo's EV workshop in Naxal. Um, you'll, anyone who wants to come, you know, to fill up that form because we don't, we want to, you know, maintain a safe distance. We don't want a big crowd there. So please fill up the form and um, you'll have to come by yourself. We're not going to provide an EV for you to, you know, come. It's going to be in Naxal. And for those of you who are in Manila, you'll have to fly all the way to Kathmandu for that. Sorry, Kath. Um, but it's going to be an exciting three days ahead. Um, best wishes and back to Kathleen for any housekeeping announcements. Thank you so much, Vishan. Uh, I was actually going to joke about that, but uh, but yes, uh, there's a lot of things that are in store for the participants who are interested to join this uh, next few days. So thank you again, and it's been a pleasure learning from this discussion. I am certain we are a lot of the people that we have here are encouraged by the commitments that we have heard today. And uh, again, as, as Vishan has mentioned, you know, through this project and through related initiatives, um, the good thing about the city training is we can approach this as this capacity building as like a, an e-mobility roundtable now where we are gathering a different set of stakeholders and discussing how do we move forward from here on uh, taking on the lessons and challenges that we learned throughout the, the, the three hours that we just had. So with that, uh, Bushan has already given you an outlook for the week. Uh, one note just uh, we'd like to raise here is that uh, for those who are interested to join the session, please register via the link. I believe somebody will provide this in the chat box. Um, the, because you know, we, for, health, uh, for safety reasons, we, we need to limit the number of participants joining the session. So uh, please sign up and then uh, we will see you there uh, on, on Friday. But do join us tomorrow and uh, the, the, the next day as uh, uh, Shritu and Shankar will walk you through the session as your moderators and as your guide. And I believe that's all that I have for the closing. And um, on behalf of Solutions Plus Project, I, I'd like to thank all the speakers who joined us and all the participants who stayed with us uh, throughout the, the three hours. And I'd also like to thank the Solutions Plus team who are in the background, Ashritu, Nash, Sam, Shankar, Sunny, Alvin, and Oliver, uh, who made this organization and the delivery of this rather smooth. And thank you also, especially to my co-moderator, uh, Bhushan. Thank you so much for uh, running this session so smoothly with us. Uh, thank you again. I'm pleased to meet you all and see you all tomorrow. And my job is to translate all that. So I'm just going to say, <laughs> Kathleen. Yes, thank you, Kathleen. A wonderful job.